Let me just go ahead and introduce folks. This is the Apologetics Academy. Website is apologetics-academy.org. I am Jonathan McClatchy, and I host this weekly online webinar where I bring on different scholars, apologists, thinkers, uh, philosophers uh, from across the theological and philosophical spectrum to present on topics of interest to Christians, particularly those topics which concern whether the gospel is true, but we also cross-examine and evaluate other worldviews, including Islam, Mormonism, atheism, and so on. Um, there's a number of ways that you can participate after um, our guest speaker gives a presentation. Then the floor is opened for dialogue, discussion, debate, um, and you can submit questions in textual form by hitting the Q&A button, which is at the top of your screen, and you can submit it anonymously if you wish. Uh, you can also click the raise hand button, also at the top of your screen, and I will promote you to be a co-panelist with our guest speaker, and you'll have the opportunity to interact and engage with them in the back and forth uh, discussion. Um, and uh, just uh, to give you an idea of what's coming up in the next few weeks, uh, September 2nd, we have uh, Dr. Bruce Gordon, who's a philosopher of physics, who's gonna talk to us about on the tension between quantum physics and physicalism. So that will be very interesting. Then the following week on September 9th, we have Stephen Grant, who is a well-known Scottish preacher, who's going to talk to us about the um, on the question, why does God need blood to forgive? Then on September 16th, I'm having an, an my, our second um, ex-atheist testimonies evening called Confessions of a Former Skeptic. So we'll have a lineup of former atheists giving their testimonies of coming to faith in Christ. So that's what's coming up over the next few weeks. So returning to, to tonight then, uh, or today, depending where you are in the world, um, we are very honored to have with us uh, Roman Catholic apologist and thinker Peter D. Williams, uh, who's uh, quite prolific on a number of different issues, um, Roman Catholic apologetics being one of them. He's also very prolific on the sanctity of life issues, as well as on uh, same-sex marriage and uh, other issues as well. So, uh, uh, Peter, just for those that maybe haven't come across you before, do you want to maybe just say a, bit, a few words about who you are and your background and then just launch into the, the topic? That would be awesome. Sure. Well, mine's, uh, thank you very much, Jonathan, for introducing me and for organizing. This is a, a great thing. Um, so I'll just introduce myself and go into the issue and say a, a bit about it and then go into the proper presentation. So I'm Peter D. Williams. Um, I have been doing Catholic apologetics properly uh, since about 2010, I'd say, since the a set up of Catholic Voices, which was a group that was set up to represent Catholics in the public square. Um, when there were very few of those going on at the, at the time because of the papal visits. The papal visit was coming up, and so it was seen that there needs to be this um, improved level of discussion and voices that could speak intelligently about Christianity, about Catholic Christianity in particular, um, in light of all the protests that were going on. I think you might remember if you were around um, at the time of the papal visit, and that just grew into the apologetics sort of monastery or ministry or apostolate um, that I've been starting since then. I'm also um, executive officer of uh, Right to Life. That's a different hat. That's not a hat I'm wearing this evening, although if someone wants to, talk, to ask me a question about that, not the subject we're discussing tonight, I'd be happy to answer that as well. But ultimately, yes, this is uh, what I've been asked to do is talk about just a comparison of the differences between Catholic Christianity and Protestantism. And when we were initially talking about this, Jonathan and I, we were talking about how I think best to, to structure that. And I came up with the idea of saying, why not just, let's use the five solas of the Reformation as a skeleton, if you like, of the principles that were about at the time, that were being discussed at the time, and that continue to this day to be things that are matters of controversy between Catholics and Protestants. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use those five solas because I think that they're very helpful in actually discerning what those differences are, particularly the first two, sol scriptura and sola fide. Um, this is something which is a sort of a personal topic for me because I have many, many friends who are uh, Protestant Christians whom I love very dearly, who I've learned a lot from, who are very dear friends of mine and, and indeed relatives. And I care about them very much. And I believe that the differences between us are important, that they are in fact matters even of salvation. But the ultimate way to deal with that is to deal with it in an honest way, in an open way, in a way that is very clear. So this presentation for me is about trying to clarify what those differences are. I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of depth because I could go into a lot of depth in a lot of these different issues. I could go into you know, purgatory or the Eucharist or things like that in, in huge depth. And that would be an hour's discussion for each topic. What I'm instead going to do is provide a survey. There's going to be a survey of the differences that will hopefully allow um, and prompt some interesting questions from uh, you who are watching 
um, but also allow from some clarification of what the differences really are, because there's a lot of misconceptions. So I'm going to just dive straight in uh, and start with the first uh, principle. Actually, I'll, I'll give this a little, <laughs> I did start with this, um, this little story just to begin with, why cl clarifications matter. Um, I was going, I, I went at one point to Madrid, uh, Madrid in uh, 2011, because it was the World Youth Day at the time. And I love cider. So I went around uh, going, asking for cider, saying, do you any cidre? Uh, have you any cider? Um, unfortunately, I wasn't, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't pronouncing it like that. I was pronouncing it uh, cidre, like the French do, because there are cidre, as you see on the screen, had just come out. And unfortunately, I wasn't uh, pronouncing it like that either. I was pronouncing it, um, or as far as people were concerned, like tiene sida, which of course means, do you have AIDS in Spanish? This is not what you want to say to a Spanish person when you're ordering a drink. The point of that story being that words matter, definitions matter, and, and meaning matters. And history and philosophy and theology also matter when we're defining differences of ideas between people. So because ideas matter, this is why I'm going to define the differences as they are right now. So here's the structure. The structure is going to be, firstly, we're going to deal with sola scriptura. That means scripture alone, as we'll go to understand. I'll go on and explain. And that's to do with epistemology. That's due to what, how do we know what doctrine is? How do we know what true Christian doctrine is? And what is the right authority for us when discerning what true Christian doctrine is? Because that's, that's the most basic question. If we're going to have a discussion about Christian theology and about the differences between different traditions, then we're going to have to have a discussion about what our authority ought to be in and what um, the means by which we can adjudicate true doctrine from false doctrine really is. Then we're going to go into, I think, the, the meatiest part of this whole discussion, which is going to be sola fide and sola gratia. Sola fide means faith alone. It's going to describe the... Um, as far as Protestantism is concerned, the sole instrumental cause of salvation. And I'll articulate what the Catholic view of the instrumental cause of salvation is. That language about instrumentality is going to be very important. Sola gratia means grace alone, the idea that we are saved by grace alone. That's actually something that Catholics and Protestants would both say, but we disagree fundamentally on the nature of grace. And so that's why there's going to be a difference there as well. But salvation is, I think, the stuff that people really get hot under the collar about. That's the the real material cause of the, of the Reformation, the stuff that really enlivened people. And very lastly, we're I'm going to see how much time we have towards the end to discuss how many topics we can discuss, but Sola Christus and Sola Dea Gloria are the other elements of the Reformation um, slogans, if you like. It's about Christ alone, the idea that salvation is by Christ alone, it's to the glory of God alone. Now again, those are two uh, phrases that Catholics and Protestants would both use. I would happily say Sola Christus and Sola Dea Gloria, um, but ultimately, the difference is going to lie on whether or not certain aspects of Catholic doctrine really uh, either undermine the unique mediatorship of Christ. Of course, I'm going to say that they don't. I don't believe that they do at all. But there's a, an argument to be answered there. Also, the idea of whether or not there are Catholic doctrines that in some way detract from the glory of God. Alone. And again, I don't think that's true. But again, there's an argument that needs to be answered. So let's start then with, I think, the most important um, element of what we're going to be talking about, which is um the issue of authority so i'll start with the catholic position and then compare it to the protestant position when we're asking the question how do we know what true uh, doctrine is how do we know what uh the sources of revelation are well in catholic theology we have the idea of the dual source theory so the idea is that there are two sources of divine revelation that god has given us one is holy scripture that which is in, in other words theonustos god breathed and that's what it's called in 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says all scripture is God-breathed, pasa grafe theonustos. We've also got the idea of sacred tradition, which are those truths which were passed down from the apostles and the early church, whether explicitly or implicitly, uh, or even sometimes absent from, solar, from uh, holy scripture. That's also an important element of the deposit of faith, or if you like, the deposit of truths that were given to us, um, because that also tells us things that we need to know. So those, that's the dual source theory within Catholic theology. And you see the magisterial development of both in the Catholic Church and the Church Catholic. In other words, you see there are doctrines that are, develop over time. Uh, particularly, I'll go to use the um, example, because I debated it recently, of Mariology. There are certain elements of Mariology that are things that develop later, like the Immaculate Conception. But they are things that are implicit within the original deposit of faith, and then basically through theological outworkings become more manifest over time. Now, I'll, I'll give an illustration of the relationship between um, the scripture, the tradition, and the, um, and the magisterium, or if you like, the, the teaching authority of the church. First of all, we have what's called the canon of Holy Scripture. Now, this is a, a useful uh, element of Christian truth to use as an illustration, because this is not something um, that we find in Holy Scripture, but it is something which is passed down. 
just to clarify, the canon of Holy Scripture are those uh, texts or the knowledge of which texts are indeed theonistos. So I mean, the fact that we know that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1, 2, Samuel, etc., etc., all the way to the book of the Apocalypse or the book of Revelation, depending on what you call it, that's an important theological datum. And it's a tradition. It's a truth that's passed down from us uh, from the early church. It was recognized in and by the church over time. Um, the reason why, for example, at the back of your New Testament, you have um, everything from Hebrews on, so Hebrews, James, uh, two, particularly 2, 3 Peter, 2, 3 John, uh, Jude and Revelations, all of those, those are the doctrines, those are the texts rather, which were the anti-legomena in the early church. They were the books that were spoken against because people didn't quite know who wrote, for example, Hebrews. They didn't know who wrote these, these other books. So it's not that they come chronologically later. It's not that they are later books in that sense, although I think the book of the Apocalypse can be called that. Um, it's because they were debated by the early church and then included later within the canon. So we see authentic Christian teaching. Um, we see this authentic Christian teaching of the canon. It's not something that we see within the scriptures. It's not something, I can't answer the canonicity of Hebrews by looking to the scriptures. I can't answer the canonicity of James by looking to the Old Testament or the New Testament. Um, or Jude or anything like that. I, I need to go by tradition. That's the means by which we know that important piece of revelation. So that's going to be something which I'll, I'll talk about later, why it's quite relevant. But what we see there is an authentic Christian teaching that proceeds from these two sources. We have Holy Scripture. We have another piece of datum that we need. We have another piece of theology, theological data that we need, which is the canon. That comes from sacred tradition. And those both things are recognized over time by the church progressively as a magisterial development. One thing I didn't include in the last one, which I should have put earlier, the magisterium, that is the teaching authority of the Catholic Church, is something which we see in the bishops and it's in union with the success of St. Peter, the Pope. And we see that, for example, in texts such as Matthew 16, uh, 18, uh, Matthew 18, 18, and John 20, 21 to 23. Matthew 16, 18, we see um, Peter um, recognizing the divinity of Christ. And our Lord saying to St. Peter, you have known this because the, the because God has revealed it to you, and I call you rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. He says, I call you Peter. The word there is, is Petros, but in the original um, Aramaic it would have been Kepha. We know this because the word Peter elsewhere in the New Testament that's used, uh, the, word, the word used for his name is Kephat, which is a, an, what's known as a, a Hellenization or a, a making into Greek of an Aramaic word. The Aramaic word is Kepha, it's rock. So we know what our Lord said was, I call you rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. He then gives them the keys of the kingdom. That's quite interesting, because if you go back to Isaiah 20 to 22, um, versus, uh, Isaiah 20, verses 20 to 22, what you find is the uh, then prime minister, vizier, if you like, of the uh, nation of Israel, being given the keys of the kingdom by God, um, called Eliakim. And this is giving him a, the authority of the king to rule in the king's stead, ultimately. So what's going on there is that St. Peter is being given the authority of the kingdom of God by our Lord, who is, after all, the king of the kingdom of God. That's quite important for knowing that he has a jurisdictional role within the church. We also see him then say, whoever sin, um, gives him the ability to bind and loose, whoever's, uh, the idea of binding and loosing is something which is given in Matthew 16, 18, but it's also then given in Matthew 18, 18, as, as well later on. That's given to all the apostles. So we see both St. Peter, who, as Catholic, we believe is the, uh, the original pope, if you like, the first, um, the first, what I want to say, prince of the apostles, but the first founder, if you like, of the church, apart from Christ himself, the first disciple. Both the apostles themselves, but St. Peter first, are given the keys of the kingdom and also the power to bind and loose. So that's a teaching authority, because the idea of binding and loosing was a rabbinical concept, is the idea that you were able to bind and loose your followers to certain interpretations of the law, in other words, certain teachings. So we see both a jurisdictional role being given St. Peter, and then also later on, we see a role that's given to the rest of the apostles as well with him to bind and loose. So this idea of, of magisterial teaching, the idea of magisterial authority, is given St. Peter, given to the apostles, and then we find outside the scriptures that they then pass on this authority by what's called apostolic tradition to their successors as well. And this is the way that the Holy Spirit works in, in Matthew uh, 18, 18, uh, in John 6, or 16 rather. Our Lord says that he will give the apostles the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth. So all of this together gives us the sense of the magisterial teaching authority of the church. Now let's go to the Protestant position, which is a contrast to that. 
Rather than having a dual source theory, what we have here is a single source theory. The idea that scripture alone, and I'm going to be very careful in my um, my definition here because I think the definitions really are important. I've heard a lot of people on both sides have mishandled the way the other person teaches. This is my understanding, I'm happy to be corrected, uh, but I've, I've seen that Protestant apologists have appreciated this definition of the idea of scripture alone. Scripture alone is the sole, sufficient, ultimate, infallible rule of faith. Now all of those qualifiers are variously important. I think infallible possibly needs a bit more um, explanation there. When we talk about infallibility, we mean the inability to teach error. Now, certainly that's something that both Protestants and Catholics would say about scripture, if by that we mean essentially inerrancy. Uh, we both, we all believe that scripture is inerrant, that there are no flaws within a holy scripture insofar as if scripture teaches something to be true, whether it be a matter of history, whether it be a matter of morals, whether it be a matter of metaphysics, whatever it is, those are true. Those are infallibly true, if you like. But infallibility has a sense of uh, teaching uh, as if you are a person, as if you are an active agent. And you know, obviously scripture can be uh, an active agent in the spiritual lives of, of Christians, but it's not the same as a person. So infallibility, if it means inerrancy, we have no problem. But infallibility is a problematic concept as far as scripture does not necessarily teach. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that teaches using the means of the scriptures. Nonetheless, the thing that's really important about soul scripture is the soul sufficient element. Because scripture can be said to be sufficient, according to Protestant Christianity, it can therefore be the ultimate rule of faith. If it's sufficient, however, if it's not sufficient, however, uh, to function the sole ultimate rule of faith, and this undermines the whole theory. So the, the fundamental center of the controversy around sola scriptura is the idea that scripture is sufficient. But we need to ask ourselves another question. Uh, sufficient for what? I mean, there, just as, there are, in fact, just one thing that we call Protestantism. There are various forms of Protestantism. There are Protestantisms, if you like. And so there are various variations on what sola scriptura really means. And this, for, uh, this will become, I think, important slightly later. I'll, I'll go into it. But for example, we see in the 39 articles of the Anglican Communion, the idea that when I mean, it talks in uh, section six of the sufficiency, article six of the sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures for salvation, it says the Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation. It later refers to things, all that is thought requisite or necessary to salvation. So when we say scripture is sufficient, well, scripture is sufficient for what? Scripture is sufficient in the Anglican sense, for things that are necessary for salvation, things you need to know in order to be saved. But let's compare that to the Bap uh, Presbyterian, the Baptist um, confessions that we find. In the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is the Presbyterian standard, um, chapter one of the Holy Scripture says that the whole counsel of God, this is section six, concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith and life. That's a broader definition of sufficiency. We see it's not just pertaining to things that one needs to be saved, but also everything uh, referring to man's faith and life and for the glory of God. We see in the London Baptist Confession of Faith exactly the same language because the London Baptist Confession of Faith is largely uh, a copy of the Westminster Confession of Faith. But it adds this in section one, the very beginning of section one, chapter one of the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith and obedience. So everything that you need to know to be saved, but also everything relating to faith and obedience, which again goes back to man's faith and life. So these are uh, broader uh, definitions, and that will become uh, important later. The core of soul scripture is the doctrine that scriptures alone constitute that sole, sufficient, ultimate, infallible rule of faith. That's the core, no matter what variation of Protestantism we come to. So let's go to this, to this idea of ultimacy then and infallibility. It's I argued that if the Holy Scriptures are theonistos, uh, and they're the only things, the only form of writing and the only object that is need theonustos, then surely that means that the only thing that is infallible and therefore can be only the thing, the only thing that is thereby ultimate in authority. I think that's a flawed logic. That the Holy Scriptures of theonustos is an ontological truth, right? It tells us how the Holy Scriptures came into being. That's what's being said in 2 Timothy 3.16. But it tells us that there are literally crucial theological sources as well, but not that they possess uniquely ultimate authority. I think to move from the theonustos, the God-breathed nature of Holy Scripture, to their ultimacy and authority is a false leap. I think it's important to say that they are theonustos. It's important to stress their divine and supernatural character. 
but it's quite wrong to say this thereby it thereby follows that they're the only things that are infallible because after all they are inspired by the holy spirit the holy spirit is the one that is truly infallible and we would say exactly the same thing about the holy spirit does when he guides the church if the, indeed again when we go back to john 16 the holy spirit guides the church into all truth i think we can say that the holy spirit infallibly guides the church into all truth so the fact that the holy scriptures are theonistos does not imply necessarily that they are the only form of ultimate and infallible rule of faith as for sufficiency the canon illustration that i used earlier on to illustrate that the way that doctrine works is by scriptural tradition and that magisterial development over time shows i think the idea of scriptural sufficiency to be mistaken and this becomes what i call the canon argument and it goes like this if scripture is sufficient it should give us a, a full uh, data all the data of revelation that we need all necessary data should be found within the scriptures well holy scripture itself is necessary that's another element of the idea of the broad uh, evangelical certain protestant doctrine of, of scripture is the idea that it's necessary you, you need the scriptures well if script, holy scripture is necessary then the knowledge of what is holy scripture which is to say the canon is itself necessary if you need the scriptures then you need to know what the scriptures are. So if Holy Scripture is sufficient, then it must be able to give us that knowledge of what is Holy Scripture. Otherwise, it's insufficient. But Holy Scripture can't give us the canon. There is no inspired contents page. There's no golden index. There's nowhere within the scriptures where you can tell me, yet that proves that Jude is inspired. Can't happen. Therefore, Holy Scripture cannot be said to be sufficient. Again, you need to go back to tradition, go back to the magisterial acceptance of that tradition over time. Canon is not implicitly, materially uh, within scripture. It's not uh, formally sufficient uh, for it either. Now, there are objections uh, to that uh, argument. And there are, I'll go through just two, which I think are the most compelling, or the, the ones that I think they come out the most, of, um, the most often. One is the argument that the canon is an artifact of revelation and not an object of revelation. So what this means, this is something which has been uh, used very much by Dr. James R. White, whom I've had the great pleasure to uh, discuss things on Premier Christian Radio uh, and debate with as well, uh, recent, as recently as May, uh, on the Marian Dogmas. Um, someone I really enjoy engaging in dialogue with, a very fine fellow. Um, but he uses this argument very often. The idea is that, well, the reason why the canon comes about, the reason why we have a canon, is because God has inspired certain books. And because God has inspired certain books, those certain books are canon. So everything from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way to the book of the Apocalypse, all of those are the inspired books, and that is why they are revelation, that is why they are canon. And so the canon is a, if you like, an, 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 ideologically, an ideological byproduct, an artifact of revelation itself. It's not an object of revelation. That's the argument. But for me, I, I never found this convincing. I find it a very odd argument because it really is a distinction without a difference. Frankly, the canon is both an artifact and an object of revelation. Um, it's a necessary theological datum. We need to know what the canon is. That's not something that can be disputed. So the fact that the canon is, uh, it's, it came about through the uh, process of God revealing himself, the Holy Spirit revealing himself through Holy Scripture, is neither here nor there. The ontological nature of the Holy Scriptures, the ontological origin of the Holy Scriptures, doesn't tell us anything about the fact that we still need to know what the Scriptures are. So therefore, we need to know the canon. The artifact object distinction, therefore, is an ontological answer to what is an epistemological question. It doesn't really work as a counter. The question is, how do we know the canon? Is it, if it, if all scripture is true through the scriptures, or if all scripture is not true, and indeed, if we are going by, in fact, um, tradition as well, is it through tradition? Well, again, it's through tradition. The answer is that we know the canon through tradition. It is canonized, uh, that is to say, it is recognized by the church through time. The church hearing the master's voice, hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit guiding her through time, recognizes what are and what are not the authentic scriptures. So the canon is both a demonstration of the truth of the Catholic formula, and I think it is also a disproof of sol scriptura. So the other argument that's often used uh, is the idea that, well, only those truths that are necessary uh, for salvation, um, going back to the Anglican definition of sol scriptura, it's only really those truths that are necessary for salvation that scripture is sufficient for. It's not really anything else. Well, okay, that I would say contradicts what is said in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the London Baptist Confession of Faith and other standards. But even if we use this, as it were, this minimalist idea of scriptural sufficiency, I think we run into a bit of a problem. And that is that if the Holy Scriptures contain what you need for salvation, 
again, we're going back to this idea of the necessity of scripture. If you need the scriptures, in other words, for those things that you need to be saved, then the scriptures are necessary for salvation. If the scriptures, that is to say the knowledge of the scriptures, are necessary for salvation, if the scriptures contain what you need to know to be saved, then in order to be saved, you need the scriptures, at least in some uh, indirect way. I mean, I know you could get that you could get the truths of salvation through you know, a, a gospel tract or something like that. But ultimately, where are they getting their information from? Well, it's going to be the Holy Scriptures. So ultimately, the, the data you need for your salvation is found in Scripture. If therefore you need uh, that data, you need the Scriptures. If you need the Scriptures, you need to know what the Scriptures are. So if you need to know those things necessary for salvation, then you need the canon. The canon is one of those truths that is necessary for salvation in an indirect, ultimate way. So that's why I don't think that works also as a kind of a get around of the canon question. So we see there this, this fundamental difference between us. We see the difference uh, between Catholics and Protestants is that for Catholics, scripture is one part of revelation. It's scripture and it's also sacred tradition. And then the church works as well within the magisterial context of the church's history in terms of reflecting and respecting and safeguarding that deposit of faith. The, 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 work, the role of the whole church is to accept the scriptures, to recognize what they are, to teach them faithfully, as well as the sacred traditions. And that's what we see happening over time. And the church herself, being guided by the Holy Spirit, has the gift of infallibility because she has been uh, promised that gift of binding loosing by the Holy Spirit, and also being uh, promised the guidance of the Holy Spirit in working out that divine teaching over time. But with Protestantism, the idea is that no, the problem there is that the Holy Scriptures are um, not being taught faithfully, uh, by the Catholic Church, that the, the traditions are in some way getting uh, in the way of what is taught in the Holy Scriptures. Therefore, you need scripture alone. So that I hope that clarifies the difference and why I think um, the differences sort of lie there and why I also think that you really do need uh, tradition as well as the Holy Scriptures in order to function within the church's history. Now, that's what the formal principle of the reflection. In other words, it's the principle that, uh, as it were, formed all the controversies that were going to go ahead. Because if you accept scripture alone, and particularly someone is going to accept the um, formulation of scriptural data, which I will go on to later, I'll, I'll go on to what I think about what goes on with Sol Scriptura, uh, just in sort of in closing. But if you accept Sol Scriptura and you accept the formulation and systematization of the scriptural data that was performed by Luther, by Calvin, by Zwingli, by the other magisterial reformers and the radical reformers as well, then you're going to come to very different doctrinal conclusions about salvation and about many other issues as well. So that was the formal principle of the Reformation. What we're going to move on to now, though, is precisely that formulation, what's known as the material uh, principle of the Reformation, the idea of sola fide and sola gratia. Sola fide means faith alone. Um, it's the idea that, sol that faith alone is the sole instrumental cause, as I said. We're going to go on to what that means of salvation. Sola gratia is the idea of grace alone, that we are saved by grace alone. I would say that that's a matter of the efficient cause of salvation. So the, the broad question with both these, and the reason why you'll see I'm going to conflate them together, not conflate them together, but bring them together under one heading to do with salvation, is because ultimately they form a debate about what is the nature of salvation? What is salvation? When we talk about salvation, what are we talking about? What does it mean? So what is the nature of salvation? Specifically, how is it accomplished? What is the meaning of the redemption that we have through Christ? And also, how is it appropriated? Or how does it, uh, um, what is justification of this? How is it um, given to us? How do we receive it? These are questions over causes. And I think that before we get into the meat of that, we need to know what we mean by the causes um, relevant. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is discuss firstly, some, give some, some basic ideational grounding of the nature of causes. And I think this will help in clarifying what the differences are between Catholics and Protestants when it comes to the issue of salvation. So around the time of the Reformation, around the time uh, of the 16th century, I'm going to go, the 16th century is the time of the Reformation, the 17th century is the, uh, are the debates that proceed out of that. Around the 16th and 17th centuries, you have what's known as scholasticism. And scholasticism, uh, which is an, a medieval concept that goes further back than the 16th and 17th centuries, was the attempt to use uh, the philosophy of Aristotle um, as systematized and as developed by St. Thomas Aquinas and others to, to uh, rational conclusions about theology. It's a very good way, actually, of approaching theology. So it provides us with a very important set of metaphysics and epistemology that allow us to come to understandings of theology. 
And actually, I, tr I truly believe that God put the church in a context that it did, historical context that it did, precisely so that it could receive the truths uh, that were outside it, so from pagan sources like Aristotle, and could baptize those pagan sources and make them useful for the development of theology. But regardless, the, the important thing here is the, the Aristotelian uh, set of causes, the, or what's Aristotelian causation, that can be used to discern the different forms of cause that, refer, that, that are operative within salvation. So the first four causes that are developed by Aristotle are these causes that I'm going to uh, talk about now, the material cause, the formal cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. So for example, what are the causes of a statue? When we talk about how does a statue come to be? Well, we, we, we use these four causes at the very least when we're talking about a statue. The material cause is the stuff from which the statue is composed. For example, marble. Marble is often used within the creation of statues. But the formal cause, in other words, the forming of this material into the thing that we call a statue, is the idea of statue in the sculptor's mind. Now, formal cause has a bit more of a complicated uh, involvement than that. I'll go on to that in a second. Um, but the efficient cause, what, how, how does this, uh, this sculpture come to, come to be? Yeah, okay, you've got this marble, you've got this idea in the sculptor's head, but how does it actually come to become a statue? Well, it's through the efficient or efficacious cause of the sculpture himself. The sculptor takes up his tools and forms the material cause, the marble, according to the idea in his own head, into this thing called the statue. And that, that's how it comes to be. But then there's the question, okay, but why does it come to be? That's another form of cause. What is the purpose of this statue? Why was it even thought up or, or uh, commissioned in the first place? Well, in this ca the case of this particular one we've got here, it's the glorification of the subject, in other words, Caesar. But it could be for the glorification of another body, it could be for uh, the joy of life, it could be for all sorts of other reasons. That's what's known as a final cause. Final causation, in other words, is purpose. So the material cause is the stuff out of which something is made, the formal cause is the idea of it, um, it's also the essence of it as well, that's what we'll go into when we talk about salvation. The efficient cause is how it comes to be, and the final cause is why it came to be in the first place. But wait, there's more. If it can work. There we go, just taking a while. There are further causes we can also talk about. So we've talked about material, formal causes, we've talked about the efficient cause and the final cause. There are two others that I think are, are useful to know that were developed later on as well. These are the meritorious cause of a thing and the instrumental cause of a thing. So, what are the causes of a house, for example? Well, again, we have the stuff, you know, the wood or the stone, the brick, the mortar, whatever. We have the formal cause, which is, again, the idea of the house and the, the mind of the architect. We also have the plan of the house, because what happens then is the architect puts it down in a blueprint, and the builders themselves will refer to the blueprint to know what the house is going to look like. But how does, how does this come about in terms of how, who pays for it? Well, that's the funding for the project, the meritorious cause, that which merits in a very strict sense, and we'll, we'll go into the concept of merit. What strictly merits the, the houses coming to being in the first place is the funding for the project that takes place itself. Then you've got the efficient cause. Again, that's the builders. The, efficient, uh, the builders are the, are the ones who bring it into existence. But then they use instruments. They have an instrumental cause for bringing up this house. It's not, the builders can't do it by, they could do it by their own hands, I suppose, but they use instruments by which they form this house out of the material itself. And that's the builder's tools. So the builder's tools themselves form a causal, a causal uh, role within the, the creation of the house. And again, the final purpose could be the, the, the end of the house, the provision of shelter, which is generally the purpose of housing. Now, not all of these are relevant to every case, but all of these different forms of cause provide useful category distinctions. And now I'm going to show you why that's important. Around the time of the Council of Trent, the Council of Trent was the great a Catholic Reformation Council. It was the Council of the, of the Catholic Church that defined, contrary to Protestantism, uh, what the truths um, that were controversial at the time were. And in particular, session six of the Council of Trent dealt with the issue of justification, which is effectively the salvation of the individual believer. And when it was talking about how does salvation come about, what, what are the causes of salvation, it used this schema of Aristotelian causation. And this is quite useful, I think, and we'll see. Why? I'll read out what Council of Trent said, and then I'll clarify what it's trying to say, because I think translated from the Latin, it's quite involved language, but we can simplify it. The efficient cause of salvation. So if the builder of the house is the, the efficient cause of the house, if the sculptor is the efficient cause of the statue, what's the efficient cause of salvation according to Catholic dogma? This is Catholic dogma. 
The cataficient cause is a merciful God who washes and sanctifies gratuitously, signing anointing with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the pledge of our inheritance. The meritorious cause, that which, in other words, pays for our salvation, we'll, we'll go into what that means, is his most beloved only begotten, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, when he, we were enemies for the exceeding charity or love wherewith he loved us, merited justification for us by his most holy passion on the wood of the cross and made satisfaction for us unto God the Father. The instrumental cause, so again, the instrumental cause being like the tools of the builder or the tools of the sculptor, is the sacrament of baptism, which is a sacrament of faith, without which faith, faith, no man was ever justified. That's a more developed concept, but we'll go into that later on. Now, the formal cause, as I said earlier on, um, it's a little bit more complicated than simply the idea in the mind of the builder or the, or the architect or the idea in the mind of the sculptor. The formal cause in this sense is the essence. What, what is the thing? Uh, what is it in of itself? When it, when, it gets, when it gets formed eventually, what is it? That's the form. It's the quiddity or the quiddittas, the thingness of, um, of the thing, or of whatever it is we're talking about. So if um, the plan, the blueprint of the house, is the essence of the house, is the thing that it's going to be. If the idea in the mind of the sculptor is what the statue will be in and of itself, what it is, then the, what the idea of the formal cause of salvation is, well, what is salvation? Now, what is it going to be? What, how does this affect itself in the life of the believer? So that's answered by the Council of Trent in this way. The alone formal cause is the justice of God, not that whereby he himself is just, but that where he maketh us just that to wit with which we are being endowed by him are renewed in the spirit of our mind, and we are not only reputed, that will become later for Protestant theology, but are truly called and are just, are just, receiving justice within us, each one according to his own measure, which the Holy Ghost distributes to each one as he wills and according to each one's proper disposition and cooperation. So the idea there is that the formal cause of salvation, what is salvation, what is it when it's affected within us, it's the making us just. It's the making us into just people. The washing us clean of our sin and making us clean before a holy God. Not simply counting us as clean, which we will go on to later. And then the final cause, which is not going to be at all controversial between us, I don't think. Indeed, is the glory of God and of Jesus Christ and life everlasting. That's, in other words, the reason why salvation occurs. That's why justification happens. Um, that I'm not going to go into any real, really anymore, because uh, both Catholics and Protestants would happily affirm that entirely, I think. So... Really, um, if we're going to simplify the controversial uh, Tridentine, let's say the, um, the, the parts of Trent's theology or teaching, these are what this is the way I would simplify it. The sufficient, the efficient cause of salvation can be said to be two things. We just we saw it described in that passage. We saw it's God, it's the merciful, blessed Trinity, it's God doing this within us. But then it talks about that him washing and sanctifying us gratuitously. What is the means by which he does that? Well, it's through what we would call his grace. So if the efficient cause of our salvation, that which efficaciously um, affects salvation within us, is God, principally. And then secondarily, the means by which he does that, it's through his grace. And we're going to have to define what we mean by grace later on, and we'll go on to that. The meritorious cause of salvation is the propitiatory sacrifice of the cross which made satisfaction for us unto the Father and merited our justification. Now, I don't think that's particularly controversial between Catholics and Protestants. You understand the nature of that in different ways, and we'll go on to that. The instrumental cause, that is to say, how is it, um, how, what is the instrument by which God communicates that grace into us? Well, it's faith. But faith in a Catholic context means more than what it does uh, in the concept of faith alone, which we will go on to. It's the idea of a faith that worketh by love, that by charities particularly. That includes the sacraments and it includes that, those works and charity that we engage in. So the initial instrumental cause we saw within the text is baptism. When we first come to salvation, how do we come to salvation to begin with? Well, it's through baptism. Baptism is the means of our salvation initially. But then later on, the, the means of salvation will also become confession, in other words, the sacrament of confession, which I'll go on to describe, and the Holy Eucharist as well. The Holy Eucharist plays a part in that. But it's also a faith that works by charity, which is described in Galatians 5, 6. So in Catholic theology, the, way, the faith that's truly salvific, that actually affects our salvation, is a faith that works by love. But then finally, we have the formal cause. And what's the formal cause? What is salvation itself when it's affected through the instrumental cause, bought by the meritorious cause, affected by God through his grace? Well, it's justification. It's the making just 
of sinners, that we are actually not only counted as just by him, but made just by him. So I'll just go into a little bit more detail about those things before we go into what the difference is there for, to clarify the differences, what they are. I think you know your theology, understanding the vast majority of the people who are going to be listening to this uh, webinar are going to be people from the Protestant tradition. So I, I think you probably know your tradition already. I don't feel I need I define that too much for you, but I will go into a clarification of the differences nonetheless. I'm, I'm concentrating here on trying to make sure you understand better, I hope, uh, what Catholic theology is on these questions. So when it comes to the efficient cause, the secondary efficient cause, we know that God is the, uh, the, the effector of our salvation, but he does it through his grace. What does that mean? Well, in Catholic theology, it's understood as ontic grace. What does that mean? Well, it means that the otherwise ineffable shared divine life of God, which is communicated to the believer, either by God directly, um, so a, a concept which we could go into is the concept of a prevenient grace, that before um, the, the first grace that needs to happen, the first form of divine life that needs to be uh, communicated to the believer so that they will come to God in the first place, is this what we call prevenient grace, gratia preveniens. Gratia preveniens moves the will in some way to come to faith, to begin with, so that eventually you will come to the grace of baptism. So that can be done by God directly. God has to work on the human heart, which is a heart of stone, replaceable with a heart of flesh. Um, but it can also be through the various means that God has instituted. Prayer is a means of grace. When we pray, we can receive God's grace. Uh, it's the sacraments, baptism, confession, the Eucharist, etc. We'll go into those. And a sanctified life. The good works that we do, that the life of holiness that we lead, can itself be a means of grace to us because it means that we will grow in that grace and become more and more uh, close to God and close to our eventual salvation in heaven. Grace can also, however, mean God's beneficence. In other words, God's blessing upon us. So if I talk about uh, the grace of God, if I talk about well, by the grace of God, this will happen. Really what I mean is not by his ontic grace, although that could be what I mean. It's really by the beneficence that he shows to us within our lives. So by the grace of God, um, I will um, grow in, in success in what I do. Yeah, that sort of thing. In Protestantism, grace often appears to be defined as the objective favor of God towards the believer in saving him or her within the context of this idea of imputed righteousness, this idea that um, the grace of God is him showing uh, favor, legal favor to the believer um, because of the sort of the, the substitution and swap that has occurred between the believer and Christ within the context of the redemption. We'll, we'll go on to that, but that's the difference between us, I think, is fundamentally that I believe, Catholics believe, that grace is the shared divine life of God, it's, if you like, a thing. Like, there's, no, there's no other word I can use other than shared divine life or, or thing. or um, it's, an, it's an ineffable uh, force, if you like, or life that God communicates to us that actually makes something happen. Sanctifying grace is, is the grace that sanctifies us, that saves us, that justifies us. That's what we call sanctifying grace. But also act, well, known as actual graces within Catholic theology. The idea that there are specific graces that enable certain specific actions to happen. Happen. So if I, I need God's grace to resist temptation, the grace that's given to me to resist temptation is an actual grace. It's a grace that, that allows me to perform an act or the grace that allows me to perform an act of charity. Maybe it's buying, um, buying food for um, a homeless person. Maybe it's almsgiving. Maybe it's um, doing webinars. Whatever it is, that's an actual grace that God has given me in order to perform that particular task. Now, without God's grace, none of those tasks can happen. We need God's grace in every single good thing that we do, because without God's grace, we could do none of it. That's the, the, the point that we're making. Certainly, we need God's grace, I'd say, to, uh, to, to as it were, be rewarded with, um, with, with further grace later on. We'll go into that. But we've talked about the efficient form, um, cause of our salvation. We've talked about God achieving the salvation of the individual through his grace. But how is that merited for us? How does that uh, salvation even come to be available to us? Well, it's through the redemption. In other words, it's through what Christ has done for us on the cross. And that's what we're going to talk about, what we talk about when we talk about the meritorious cause. The meritorious cause of our salvation is the redemption, which is understood by, the, by, the Catholic, uh, by Catholic Christianity as the paying back of the debt of sin to God the Father through the God-man, Jesus Christ, by the means of his propitiatory sacrifice on the cross. Without that sacrifice, there would be no economy of salvation, if you like. There would be no means by which we would achieve the salvation that we have. Because only by 
what Christ did on the cross. It's only by Christ himself dying for us on the cross and saving us that we can be saved at all. I think that's something we would all believe as Christians. Uh, that's something that Catholics and Protestants would agree on. But again, we're going to mean something very different by that. What we mean as Catholics is that the way that the, the cross works, I, I heard uh, Jonathan say that there's going to be a talk, uh, I think another webinar in a few months' time, about uh, why does God need, um, need blood, the, the, the payment of blood, if you like, salvation. Well, the reason for that is because that's what's been established, I think. I'm not going to uh, gainsay that particular uh, talk. But that's a really interesting question because it, it does actually go into the meaning of the redemption. And the meaning of the redemption within Catholic Christianity is that the infinite value of the shedding of the precious blood of Christ and the infinite love with which that sacrifice was made merited the extension of grace to all mankind. Now, only the elect will ultimately appropriate that salvation offered through Christ. But ultimately, that's what it's talking about. In the Old Testament, a helpful uh, parallel is when we talk about the blood of the lamb within the, um, the ritual uh, around Passover. The, the reason why the, uh, the blood of lambs or the blood of, um, the blood of goats or the blood of any animal was used in the sacrifices of the old law was because according to Jewish belief, according to, if this is kind of a spiritual metaphysic within the Old Testament, the blood of the animal contained its life. And it was the giving of life that was truly, if you like, the currency of salvation. It paid back the debt of sin. Now, ultimately, we know from uh, Hebrews, we know from what Christ said, that actually the shedding of the blood of animals cannot really pay back the debt of sin. It's an infinite debt that can never really, truly pay back the debt of sin. It was always really just a pointing to the real ultimate sacrifice that truly would pay back the debt of sin, which is the salvation of Christ through his precious blood. The, the blood contains his life. And he, as the God-man, has infinite value, unlike the blood of any human being, unlike the blood of any uh, animal, unlike the blood of anything. Only the God-man had the uniquely precious, infinite value of his life to give to the Father in propitiation for our sins. And because he did that, both as a victim and as a priest, he paid back the infinite debt of sin infinitely. And by doing so, Paul, uh, merited the, the grace of our justification and merited the forgiveness of our sins, paying back that debt that we, on our own, would never pay. And actually, one of the, the books I've been reading since July is this book here. It's called The Precious Blood of Christ. It's uh, by Father Faber, who was one of the founders of the uh, London Oratory, which is my uh, church. And it's about the price of our salvation. It's about the uh, spiritual means by which we can appreciate the price of our salvation, which is the precious blood of Christ. Now, I personally happen to be a member of the Confraternity of the Precious Blood, which is uh, a Catholic um, confraternity, which is about really having a devotion to the precious blood of Christ, um, particularly. So that's quite an important element of our whole religion. This is, this is the most, one of the most core and important doctrines that you can talk about. But that's the, an understanding of, of the way the redemption works, which is actually quite different to the classic Protestant understanding. The classic Protestant understanding is what's known as penal substitution. Now, you know this better than I do, probably, but the idea, obviously, is that God the Father um, is just. We must, uh, he must, therefore, have his justice satisfied. Now, obviously, in the Catholic understanding, that justice is satisfied through the paying back of the debt of sin, through the blood of Christ, which is infinitely precious because of the role that Christ is playing as, as priest and victim. But in Protestantism, it appears to be the case that it's about God must uh, pour forth his wrath, his justice upon a sinful man. And the only person who can take that wrath for us is the God-man, Jesus Christ. So again, it's because he's the God-man that he can withstand the full wrath of God, the full wrath of God the Father being poured upon him. Um, and by doing so, by, by taking that full punishment in our stead, by being that penal substitute, he therefore accomplishes the salvation um, of, well, depending on which kind of Protestant you are, either of mankind or only of the elect. It depends whether you're a Calvinist or a minion or some other form, um, maybe an amorality and something like that. But that's the, the difference, I fundamentally, in our understandings of the meritorious cause. We both agree that the meritorious, sole meritorious cause of salvation is the blood of Christ. There is no other form, there is no other thing that can save us, there is no other uh, means by which we can be saved. There's nothing else that can earn the grace of God. There's nothing else that can achieve our justification. It's only the blood of Christ that can do that. What we disagree on is how that works. What is the logic of the redemption? So that's an important difference to note, but I hope that clarifies the difference on us between the meritorious cause. Now, okay, we've talked about the instrumental cause of our salvation, which, uh, sorry, the, um, the efficient cause of our salvation, which is God's grace, the merit which is how 
met grace, earns us that grace. But how is it that we receive the grace of God? Well, again, that's going to be very different between us. Um, for the Catholic Church, I'm going to go into the Catholic doctrine here. It's through a faith that works by love, but it's through faith, but not alone. I think that faith is a useful catch-all term. It's a good synecdoche for, and which is, a, if you like, a concept, a, 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 a bringing together of all the elements of what salvation truly is, or the instrumental cause of salvation is. But it's not f simple belief alone. Certainly, it's not what we call fiduciary faith. So, what is, what are the instrumental causes of salvation? Well, it's firstly baptism. Baptismal regeneration is a classic Christian doctrine. I would happily debate anyone on baptismal regeneration. I think that it, I actually think that baptismal regeneration is one of the, one of those doctrines that you can act, scripture is actually sufficient to give you. I think that it's so clear uh, from scriptural passages that baptism really does regenerate. Um, that's an important truth. I'll go into those scriptural passages. Confession as well, I think is another uh, form of our salvation, uh, an instrumental cause by which we come to salvation. Um, I've wrongly put, I put the wrong scriptural reference there, but I'll correct that later on. Um, the Eucharist as well is a means by which we are saved. And then again, it's a faith that worketh by charity, but a faith that works by self-giving love. So firstly, baptism regeneration um, it is through baptism, it is through the reception of baptism that we are regenerated. I think that's so completely clear. In Acts 2, 37, 38, and these other uh, scriptural passages. In Acts 2, uh, 37 to 38, St. Peter is asked, by uh, those who are cut to their hearts by the preaching of the gospel. Okay, brethren, what must we do to be saved? That's the question they're asking. What must we do to be saved? What's St. Peter's answer to that? The answer he gives is repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, he doesn't say repent and believe for the forgiveness of your sins and be baptized to symbolize this thing that you've just received. No, no, no. He says, repent and be baptized. These two things for the forgiveness of your sins. The, the, the cause of your being forgiven for your sins is repentance and it's baptism. That, I think, clearly shows us um, that we are saved not by uh, simple belief, for example, but also by, the, by, by baptism itself. I'm going to actually get up my copy of the scriptures so that I can read these passages rather than rely on memory, which would, I think is probably a good idea. So... Acts 22. So when um, in Acts 22, 16, we um, talk about someone being told, and now why tarriest thou, rise up and be baptized and wash away your sins, invoking his name. So what is it? It's rise up, be baptized for the washing away of your sins, invoking the name of Christ. Again, I think that follows on from Acts 2, 37 to 38, very, very uh, clearly. Now, Romans 6, uh, 46 as well, I think is quite clear in terms of the role that is played by baptism. For we are buried together with him by baptism into death, that as Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. But if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed to the end that we may serve sin no longer. The idea here is that baptism unites us to Christ's resurrection, that we are buried with him in Christ, and then we are in baptism, and then we are risen together with him. So in baptism, the effects of our dying to our old self and being risen again to the new man, to justification, that's very clear, I think, from Romans 6, 4 to 6. 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21 is possibly the clearest example we have in all the Holy Scriptures about the means by which um, salvation plays within our salvation. Uh, St. Peter has used the example of the, uh, the great flood in Genesis, um, and he's using that as a type uh, for what baptism will eventually be. So he goes, you will go into it. When a few of those eight souls were saved by water and baptism which this referred to now saves you baptism which this referred to now saves you not as the putting away of the filth of the flesh i like that translation because it's literally what it says in the original Greek. Uh, not even putting away of the filth of the flesh but the examination of a good conscience towards god by the resurrection of jesus christ uh, that examination actually is the appeal for a clear conscience towards god by the resurrection of jesus christ now 
The reason why he's saying not by the putting away of the filth of the flesh and talking about the, um, the appeal for a clear conscience is because in the times uh, that uh, St. Peter would have existed, they had actually a Jewish conversion um, ritual known as the Tevelah. And the idea was that you went into a ritual bath for the mikvah and you would be washed. Uh, you'd literally be washed physically. And that would make you ritually pure. So you could then go and, and enjoy the rest of, of the religion. Well, that's not what's going on in baptism. It's not about the washing away of the filth of your flesh. It's not being about being made outwardly clean. It's about the appeal for a clear conscience. Now, obviously, if you're saved already by, let's say, your, your faith that existed prior to you being baptized, and if, you're not, if you don't have faith, you're not going to be baptized in the first place, then how are you appealing for a clear conscience? Surely your conscience should already be clear. In fact, it's through going through baptism that you receive a clear conscience because your sins are being washed away within the sacrament itself. And again, we could talk about John 3, 6 and Titus 3, 6, both of which talks about being buried in baptism, both of which being talked about being uh, risen to that new life. So clearly there's a role there for the instrumental cause of salvation initially being baptism. Baptism is an instrumental cause alongside and with faith. It's the sacrament of faith. But then later on, when we need, we of course go into sin after uh, we, we receive our salvation. We are told um, in uh, John 1 John 3, I think, uh, 15, 16, talks about there are sins that lead to death and there are sins that do not lead to death. Those sins that lead to death are what we would call mortal sins. In Catholic theology, in Eastern Orthodox theology, in Oriental Orthodox, we have the idea that, yes, your sins themselves can lose your salvation. They are grave enough if they involve a a true rejection of God, as a sin always does. Sin is, in, in fact, a rejection of God. Um, if it has sufficient gravity, then there are those, that, those sins that have sufficient gravity can, are sins that lead to death. They are those that cut us off from God. So after salvation, we clearly do need a means by which we can come back to that form of repentance, receive again the grace of justification that we have hitherto lost through our mortal sins. And that's exactly what we have when we talk about confession. So I'll go to I should just get a book, would make it much quicker than ironically the supposedly easier electronic means. But there's a point uh, in John, I believe it's John 21, where he says to the apostles, he breathes on them, he says to them, um, I give you the gift, I give you the, the Holy Spirit. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. So he's talking to the apostles, he's breathing on them. So when you breathe on, uh, when God breathes on someone, he's conferring upon them the Holy Spirit, he's conferring upon them his power. He's giving them this spe specific authority to forgive sins or to retain sins. But the only other interpretation of that verse that I've seen is, is the idea that, well, this is really talking about the preaching of the gospel. I, I really can't take that as very seriously as a counterinterpretation because clearly it's not talking about simply preaching the gospel to people. He's actually giving them a power to forgive sins or to retain them, on the other hand. So this is following on again from the authority he gave to bind and loose. He's also given the power to forgive and retain sins as well. This is something which he's giving to his apostles and to his church, this idea of being able to forgive and retain sins, to absolve, in other words, in the name of God. Well, that's very much the foundation of confession. We see throughout Christian history, again, the Catholic Church is not the only church that has this. We also have the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Oriental Orthodox, who also, and the Assyrian Church of the East, also have this sacrament by which the confession of sins to a priest, that is to say, a successor of the apostles, is uh, associated with the forgiveness of those sins, the absolve of them, the absolution of those sins, I should say, because really only God forgives sins, but the priest's role is to absolve in God's name. That's something which God has given to his church. The, the church is the minister of redemption in that sense, the instrumental means by which the world receives the grace of God, whether it be through the preaching of the gospel, whether it be through the reception of the sacraments. This is the, the church is the means by which God has given us, the instrumental means by which God has given us the grace of redemption. So again, we've got confession. Luke 22, 19. The Eucharist, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit because I'm, I'm realizing that uh, we're, we're going to run out of time otherwise, but the Eucharist is uh, something which forgives sins by virtue of the fact that when Jesus says to the apostles in Luke 22, 19, um, he's uh, just offered the bread um, and he says, this is my body. He takes the bread, the orthos in Greek. He says, this is my body. Now, the actual word um, uh, for this is not, as with orthos, a masculine um, word. It's actually a neuter word. So it's not being used 
uh, to refer to the masculine object, because generally speaking in Greek, it's not always the case, but I think it's, it's, this is a probabilistic argument circling for the Greek within this passage. When you refer to a particular object, you use the same uh, gender as the object to which you're referring. In this case, what we're referring to is something which is a new sir. So saying this, this new substance, this new thing is my body, which is soma, which is indeed a neuter noun. This is my body, which is given for you, being given for you actually, and therefore do this as an anamnesis, a remembrance, a memorial sacrifice of me. The word anamnesis actually is the one word in Greek for remembrance, which actually does have the connotation, if you go back to the Old Testament parallels, of there being a, a, a sort of a memorial sacrifice being performed. So what our Lord is doing there is he's giving to his apostles this commission to do this, do this sacrifice of him, which is his, this sacrifice of his body, as a memorial sacrifice of him throughout time. We see the very same kind of language with regards to these, uh, with, this, with regards to the gender here, being used in 1 Corinthians 11. So I think this shows us that there, in fact, is being an institution here of a priesthood, that in fact what was being given to the church is this idea of the Eucharist being the means by which God confers his life to us, uh, being a propitiatory sacrifice, not another propitiatory sacrifice on top of the cross, but rather one which is representing the one-time sacrifice of, cross, of, of Christ on the cross to us throughout history. That in and of itself is something which, according to Catholic theology, does in fact forgive us our venial sins. If I go and receive communion tomorrow, any venial sins, and that is to say any sins that I've committed that do not comp uh, constitute a, a rupturing of my relationship with Christ, um, those are forgiven, those are washed away by my reception of communion. And finally, it's a faith that works by charity, which is an instrumental means by which we are saved. That's a, a phrase that's used in Galatians 5, 6. We also see in 1 Corinthians 13, the idea of faith, even if it be a, a faith that can move mountains, if it's not with love, if it's not with charity, the word specifically in the Greek there being agape, which is not just love in a general sense, but love that is self-sacrificial love, the love that in fact God is. When it says in uh, 1 John, Theos agape estin, you know, God is love. It's talking about the specific form of love that God is, which is agape, self-sacrificial love for the other. So love is the thing that you need to complete faith. Faith is, needs to be faith, fides formate caratate. It needs to be faith that is formed by what in Greek is agape, in Latin is caritas, and in uh, English we would call charity, which is to say, again, self-giving love. It's unfortunately been mixed with charity uh, you know, giving to charity, um, what it means is self-giving love, of which alms giving is only one example. Now, here I think it's important to, to make a distinction here of how are works uh, involved in our salvation. I've just mentioned a faith that works by love. I'm sure that pricks up the ear of any Protestant watching. Uh, how does work, how are works coming in here? Surely this is competing with what Christ has done on the cross. Well, no, it's not. And that's because in order to understand that, we need to understand the meaning of merit within salvific works within uh, Catholic Christianity. We have to be careful here of ling linguistic anachronism. The English word merit is not the same as the Latin word from which it comes, which is meritum. Meritum actually has a more complex meaning than the word meritum in English. But strictly speaking, there are two forms of merit and two forms of Sub subcategories of the second form of merit. The, the first form of merit is strict merit, merit in the way that we would mean it, how you earn something. You might say, I, I merit my wage, the, the wages that I get, the salary that I get every year, I merit that because I work. That's, the, that's what we would call strict merit. So that's the merit that we would talk about in a quid pro quo relationship between uh, employer and employee. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about merit or meritum with regards to uh, human beings who are believers, who are meriting, if you like, the grace of God in Christ. The kind of merit we're talking about there is what's known as meritum de condigno, which is condign merit. And specifically, that's a form of merit that really means reward. So, strictly speaking, in Catholic theology, only Christ alone, by, again, we heard about uh, what we mean by his, his sacrifice on the cross, only Christ alone strictly merits the grace of God. Only him. Only Christ alone, by his sacrifice on the cross, merits the grace of God. I hope I've made that very clear. It's only Christ alone that can do that. But Catholic theology teaches, and I think that Holy Scripture and sacred tradition teaches um, accordingly, that man can receive grace as a meritum, a reward for his good works. What's, okay, you might say, well, what's the difference between a reward and a merit in a strict sense of an earning? Well, let's go to Romans 2, 6 to 11. 
It says in Psalms 2 11, he will render to every man according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. And for those who are factious and do not obey the truth, but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. The point he's making here against the Judaizers, of course, is that it's not about being Jewish. Um, it's not about um, and somehow you're in a secondary uh, status if you're not Jewish, which is the whole past, past, um, point of the polemic he's making in Romans. Actually, in fact, it's about the same thing for everyone. It's about faith, but it's also in this passage particularly about the reward due to our works. By our good works in Christ, if we are justified human beings, we are, in other words, believers who are in a state of grace, in a state of justification. We are rewarded with the grace of God. Not on the basis of the strict value of our actions, again, not as a matter of earning, but because God has promised to give us further grace based on our good actions. Merit is not reward in the sense of a quid pro quo earning, like in an employment relationship. It's grace in and of itself. So I, I think a helpful analogy here is the analogy of a father and a child. If a father says to a child, you know, so if you, if you mow the lawn, if you uh, if you do any of the, the kind of chores you might do around the house, uh, tidy your room, whatever it is, um, I'll buy you your favourite comic, or I'll take you to the pictures, um, or I'll buy you an ice cream, or something like that. Now, if he says that, is that the same as paying him, the, the child, a wage? Well, no, of course it's not. I mean, a wage is a commercial quid pro quo relationship under, under contract. It's a transaction based on the agreed value of the work. It's a legal obligation to pay the monetary value of the work which has been performed. Um, it's something which obliges, on a legal level, the individual who's the employer to pay the employee. That's not what's happening with a father and a child. There is no obligation involved at all, except, I, I suppose, an obligation of honour. The father could have easily, just, just and entirely justly, because he's the father of the child, order the child to do the good uh, work without any promise of reward at all. That would be entirely just and entirely appropriate. But he only obligates himself in any way by the fact that he's made a gracious promise to the child to reward the good work the child has done. Now, in the same way, God is our father, we are his children. As believers, uh, those who are adopted into him by baptism, we are his children, we are his adopted sons and daughters. And by that fact, if he commands us to do good works, we are only really doing what we ought to be doing anyway. We should be performing good works, we should be obeying uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, we should be uh, going out of our way to be charity, but we should be doing that anyway. That's simply something which we are obligated to do by virtue of our Christian discipleship and by virtue of being his sons and daughters. But he graciously, as we see in Romans 2, has promised us to give, that he will give us his grace, further grace, to grow in holiness, to grow in sanctification. And that's what we mean when we talk about merit. We're not meaning something that we earn. We're talking about a reward that we're given entirely graciously by God himself. And remember, when I said earlier, that we can do nothing, no act can be done that is good by us without his grace. Certainly no merit-worthy uh, work we can do without his grace. It is only by the grace of God that we can do that. What is God doing? He's rewarding us for the things he's enabling us to do in the first place. He's really crowning his own merits by doing that. That's Catholic teaching. If you read uh, sections 2006 to 2011, I believe, 2014, of the Catholic Catechism, this is explained very clearly. So anyone who thinks, any Protestant uh, apologist who wants to say something like, oh, well, um, you, you know, Catholics um, are somehow earning their salvation, um, they are um, earning their salvation by the uh, performance of the law, um, that is a complete caricature of what Catholics really believe. What we really believe is, yes, you should be obeying the law, um, the law, you should obey the law because you want to remain in right relationship with God, not because you need to do it because you need to fulfill these certain conditions in order to earn your salvation. That, that's a total caricature. You need to obey the law, yes, because you want to remain in right relationship with God. But doing those things also receives a reward from God, which makes us grow in holiness. And that growing in holiness, that growing in sanctification, is part of this, the process of, of our justification. Because after the fullness of our justification will, we, will be when we are made perfect in heaven. None of us are perfect right now. We, we hopefully are growing towards that perfection that God is calling to us uh, to be. You know, be perfect as I am perfect. Be perfect as your Father in your heavenly Father is perfect. But that can only happen through the grace of God, which we can merit by our good works, which God is enabling us to do in the first place by his uh, active graces, by his actual graces. 
Okay, so having come to all of that, I think we can talk about what the agreements therefore are and the disagreements are between Catholics and Protestants on these points. We have on the one hand, I think, the fact of the sole efficient cause of salvation, which is God by his grace. We, both Catholics and Protestants, utterly agree on this point. It is God who saved us as the principal efficient cause of our salvation, and it's by his grace. Now, note, I'm going to, at the bottom of the screen, I say, note the facts nature distinction I'm going to be bringing in here. It's the fact of God's salvation by his grace that we agree on. The nature is going to be something we go into a bit of disagreement. The fact of a sole meritorious cause of salvation, that it's the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. That again is something that the fact of which we totally agree on. Now the nature of it, again, is something we've seen we disagree on. We, we don't agree on whether it's, um, as it were, about the meritorious um, history sacrifice of Christ on the cross or whether it's by penal substitution. That's a disagreement that we have. It's the nature of that meritorious cause that we're going to disagree on. But it's the fact of it that we agree on. And we also agree, I think, again, on the fact and the nature of the final cause. The purpose of salvation, we both agree, is the glory of God and of Jesus Christ and of life everlasting. So that, I think, is, a, is something, the one thing we can absolutely agree on. But it's the fact of the sole efficient cause and the fact of the sole meritorious cause that we have no problem with. But here's where the disagreements come in. So we've heard about the fact of the efficient cause, that it's God by his grace, but we disagree on the nature of the efficient cause. So for Catholics, we believe that it's God's shared divine life, that we are in fact participating in what we will participate in fully in heaven by the grace of God, which will be uh, ontic grace, the shared divine life of God, when we are part of the made partakers of the divine nature, as it says in one, uh, 2 Peter 1, 4. Uh, now in Protestant theology, it uh, seems to me to be the idea that it's the divine subjective favour of God. And by that I mean uh, the legal favour that he has on the believer by virtue of the legal swap that has been made. The, the fact that the, the righteousness of Christ is being imputed to the believer uh, and the sinfulness of this believer has been imputed to Christ, which is why he took on the punishment of the cross. So that the this punishment that Christ took, we you know, no longer, that is to say, the believer no longer has to take. And the righteousness of Christ legally is imputed to the believer so that when God looks, God the Father looks at the uh, believer, he sees in fact Christ. So that's, the, that's what we mean by grace, I think, in the Protestant tradition. Again, I'm happy to be corrected on any uh, misapprehension that I might have about Protestant Christianity. I'm, I don't claim to be perfect. I'm, I'm sure that there are things that I might get wrong as well. So hopefully someone will correct me if that's the case. And that will mean we'll have a better clarification of the differences between us. The nature, again, the facts of meritorious cause, we totally agree on, but the nature of the meritorious cause, we disagree on. The meritorious redemptive sacrifice of Christ, uh, that he is by virtue of his precious blood offered to the Father, meriting, paying back the debt of sin and, and meriting the grace uh, that will be infused into us. That's a different understanding of the way the cross works than penal substitution, the idea that God is pouring out his wrath on Christ, that he does not need to pour it out on the believer. Again, the instrumental cause, that's something which, again, is at the core of sola fide. The instrumental cause of salvation for a Catholic is faith, but faith is defined as a faith that works in charity, and that includes the sacraments, baptism, the Eucharist, self, uh, confession. Whereas for Protestantism, those, uh, the only thing that you need is fiduciary faith. Um, what, we, what is classically called fiduciary faith? Pardon me. Pardon me. Um, fiduciary faith meaning belief, trust in the salvation that Christ offers, um, by the cross and repentance. Those are the three things that I think, um, according to classical Protestantism, are uh, the one form alone of faith that will save. Now, obviously, I realize that there are people who do not uh, hold to classical Protestantism. I realize that there are people in the whole lordship controversy uh, who believe that it's really literally only belief alone, that repentance is not necessary, uh, that uh, there is no need to show forth that justification by the good works of one's life. Uh, there's no need. Uh, for anything beyond simple intellectual assent uh, to God seems to be the, the um, understanding of these folks. But that's not classical Protestantism. And in fact, it's not really representative of the majority of Protestants either. I realize that there are, can be some people who I think uh, caricature Protestant theology as thinking that, well, it's, it's really about, it's antinomian, that's to say. It denies that there's any, necess any necessity uh, for good works to be shown in the, in the believer's life. But obviously, I think that the classic Protestant position and the position that I think the majority of Protestants take is that you do need good works only insofar as if you are a true believer, then because you're a good believer, you will do good works. The good works are not necessary for salvation in any way. They in no way merit, whether by a strict merit or by a reward merit sense, um, any kind of grace from God. 
it's simply that if you're a true believer, you will do good works. And one of the ways you know you're a true believer is that you do good works. Uh, for some people, classically in, in pop and history, good works have been a sign that you are a member of the elect, for example. Uh, what modern Protestants think of that idea, I'm not sure, but that certainly has been a, a phenomenon. And then finally, the formal cause. Again, well, what is salvation? The difference between us is that we believe that it is the infused righteousness of God, that it is Christ's righteousness that is poured into us that makes us like him, that we become like him, that we are made righteous. That our, my sin is not, uh, you know, I'm not a dunghill covered in snow is the, the classic uh, example that uh, may be taken from Luther. Um, I, in fact, the, the dunghill has gone. It's washed away. It's, the sin is no more. It's delivered. It's finished. It is wiped away. It's washed away by the grace of God that the Holy Spirit now indwells within me when I am uh, washed clean of my sin in waters of baptism uh, or through the sacrament of confession. And I am now the new man in Christ. So I am righteous, not because of my own righteousness, not by a mixture of my righteousness with Christ. No, by Christ's righteousness alone poured into me by the reception of the grace of the sacraments and by the grace that I can also receive by prayer and by good works. Or obviously in Protestantism, it's the idea that no, righteousness is not something poured into you. It's something which is imputed in a legal sense to you. And then after that, not as a part of the order of salvation, but just as a part of uh, the order of um, your Christian life, God will sanctify you by uh, working within you. Now, there are, contra uh, there are critiques of the Catholic position, and I'm going to just identify very quickly some, um, some responses that I would make to those critiques. One critique is that in some way, um, the Catholic conception of salvation contradicts the gospel. There's a, often, um, I know particularly, um, they'll be appointing to Galatians 5, where it will say in Galatians 5, 1 to 5, um, which we'll in fact on to Galatians 5, 1 to 5 later on. I'll, I'll read it out and I'll, I'll make a comment on that. There's another uh, fallacy, which is another uh, argument, which is that what I call the works righteousness fallacy. And it's the idea that, well, by uh, relying on the sacraments and by relying on your good works, you're in some way engaging in a kind of works righteousness. So you're earning the grace of God in some way, um, and that's works righteousness. Well, that's not what Catholic doctrine teaches at all. Um, as I've already pointed out, it's not that the good works that I do strictly merit salvation. Uh, it's not that the sacraments in no way strictly merit salvation. These are simply instrumental means by which we receive the grace of God. Nothing we do can earn the grace of justification. That's a teaching of the Catholic Church. If you read the first few uh, canons on justification at the Council of Trent, it explicitly condemns and denies Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. Both of those have already been denied by things like the councils like the Council of Orange, uh, by the teachings of St. Augustine. This is, it was very clear from the, what we'd call the ordinary magisterium of the Catholic Church that Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism were heresy, are heresy, have always been heresy since their uh, recognition in the fourth and fifth centuries. So there's no sense in which a Catholic believes that they earn their salvation. That is a total fallacy. It's a mischaracterization of Catholic teaching. Also, it's a bit of a problem because as soon as you admit an instrumental cause at all in your scheme of salvation, you admit that there is a distinction between the meritorious and instrumental cause, um, causes of salvation. And if you conflate the two together, as I think the works righteousness fallacy does, if you try to pretend that by virtue of the fact that you have these instrumental causes, like a faith that works by love, like the sacraments, and those are somehow works righteousness. Well, I'm afraid that undermines your own position because you believe in an instrumental cause as well. It's called faith. Um, and faith, if it's an instrumental cause, is something that you do in order to receive the grace of God. Well, if it's something that you do, how is faith not an instrumental cause? Uh, sorry, how is faith not the meritorious cause by the works righteousness critique, but somehow faith working in love and the sacraments are? That makes no sense to me. Particularly if you're trying to say that, well, um, faith is the only uh, mean instrumental cause of salvation. I mean, it only says faith. It doesn't say works. It doesn't say uh, anything else. It only says that we're saved by faith. Well, again, faith for us is a synecdoche. Faith con 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 uh, conceptualizes all of the means of salvation, whether it be um, a faith that works in love or whether it be the sacraments. And in fact, the first and last time the word faith is used in the book of Romans is in the phrase, the obedience of faith. So, Faith, I think, does encapsulate those things. But you would say exactly the same thing. As a Protestant, if you are one of these people who believes in the works righteousness uh, critique of Catholic theology, you would say the same thing. Surely, unless you're one of these people who thinks that no literal belief is all that you need, because that's all that pistis means. The word pistis in Greek, faith, that's all it means, belief. If you think that only pistis saves, then literally only belief saves, and not repentance, and not trust. Because that isn't implied by the word on its own. 
But you, of course, do believe that, in fact, faith does not just mean belief. It also means, again, repentance. Repentance is absolutely core. And trust in God. Fiduciary faith, the faith that Luther and Calvin believed saves, is, in fact, a synecdoche. It includes things beyond the simple semantic meaning of the word faith, which is intellectual essential belief. So either way, faith is involved here. And it's not a form of works righteousness, whether it's the uh, the Protestant uh, understanding of repentance is not a works righteousness and, and trust is not a works righteousness. Well, then why is why works faith, uh, works in love and the sacraments forms of works righteousness? None of that makes any sense. I'll, I'll just give a, a, an analogy to show why I think the meritorious and instrumental causes are meaningful in, in terms of as, a, as an illustration of how salvation works. I call it the shower analogy. I think this is a very helpful analogy. Um, let's, let's say I'm a child. Again, going to the father-child relationship, because we are all children of God. What are the causes of my being made clean when I was a child? Well, the meritorious cause of my salvation, let's say what paid for my having a shower that would cleanse me of the dirt of my body, let's say the dirt would represent sin, I represent me, um, is the paying of the water bill. Now, my dad paid the water bill. When I was a child, my dad paid the water bill. So I didn't do it. It was him alone. So the father paid the water bill by, uh, in this sense, um, by paying of the water bill, but that's analogous to, in this example, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The efficient cause against my dad, uh, the father paid, uh, is, a, is the efficacious, is the effector of my being washed of my sin or salvation. Water is the means by which that happened. Uh, water can represent grace in this uh, circumstance. But the instrumental cause of my receiving the washing of the dirt from my body was the turning of a faucet. Yeah. That now, my turning of faucet merit my getting a shower. Uh, only my dad paying the water bill did. It wasn't the efficient cause either. It was only me, it was simply the instrumental means by which I accessed what had already been paid for by my dad for me. So that I think is a good analogy for the idea of salvation. Again, only what the Father does can save me. Only his grace can save me. Only Christ meriting that grace can save me. But what do I need to do? I need to turn the faucet. And in that case, it's my faith, which also includes the, the, uh, the sacrament of faith, which is baptism, the uh, meritorious good works of charity that are in my life, and the other sacraments like confession, the Eucharist. Those are all forms of instrumental cause, not meritorious cause. My going to confession doesn't merit my salvation. My getting baptized didn't merit anything. Uh, my, my good works, again, in no strict sense, can merit my salvation. There are only rewards that God is graciously giving to me that is enabling me to do in the first place. So in no way can these instrumental causes that we've identified be called meritorious causes. In that case, they are not forms of works righteousness. So I think that key distinction is necessary to understand the difference between us. So again, let's compare this with Galatians 5, and we're moving towards the end of this section now. Galatians 5 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand fast then and do not sub submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is bound to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Now this is used as, an, as a, a scriptural passage that proves that somehow Catholic Christianity denies the gospel. That's quite a serious charge. But if you read the context, it's clear it has absolutely nothing to do with the content of Catholic theology, which I've explained, I hope, in, in almost mind-numbing de detail. Um, the idea is that um, Catholicism is allegedly a false gospel because it adds a single thing to the means by which we are saved, which is namely faith. But this is not what Catholic Christianity is doing, is not adding anything to the instrumental uh, cause of salvation. It's not adding anything. Um, what it's doing... Um, What's happening here within Galatians 5, what is being critiqued by Paul, is a false gospel that denies the sole meritorious cause of salvation. What the Judaizers were doing were not adding something to faith. They weren't saying, okay, you need faith, but you also need circumcision. What they were saying was, actually, the sacrifice of Christ, implicitly, is not sufficient for salvation. You actually need to go back to the old law. Because what's the point of being circumcised? Circumcision was not a meritorious thing that the, the Judaizers think you need to do on top of faith. It wasn't something that earned you anything. It's never been a part of Jewish belief. The idea of circumcision was being a part of the Jewish covenant. You were joining the Jewish covenant by being circumcised. And they were saying that unless you're a Jew, unless you are a member of the Jewish covenant, unless you are following the old law, 
you cannot be saved. Christ alone, in this sense, was not sufficient for them. The meritorious uh, cause of their salvation, which is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, was not sufficient. They needed the old law. That's what's happening in Galatians 5. But if that's what's happening, that's not analogous in the slightest to what's going on in Catholic Christianity. Again, I've made pains to point out what the church teaches, which is that the sole meritorious cause of salvation is what the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. The only thing that all these so-called additions to the instrumental cause of salvation are, are simply other forms, other means by which the grace of God comes to us. They are not meritorious causes. They are not competing with the sacrifice of Christ. And therefore, they do not fall under the critique that Paul is making in Galatians 5. Galatians 5 is about adding to the meritorious cause. It's not about instrumental causes. It's about adding to the meritorious cause by saying the meritorious cause isn't sufficient. You need the old law as well. Well, again, Catholics aren't going back to the old law. We're simply practicing in its fullness the new law, which is the law founded by Christ, which is the gospel, the didache, all the means of the Christian religion that Christ gave us. So I've made all that point there. And that's why Catholic Christianity has never done anything like the guys. It's rather it says what St. Paul then goes on to say in verses 5 to 6, which is, for through the Spirit, by faith, we wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is, is of any avail, but faith working through love. Charity, in words, agape, self-giving love. So in fact, that's underscoring what I've already said about the Catholic position. Okay, so we're coming now, I think, to the end. Um, I've gone a little bit longer than I was uh, hoping to, but I kind of assumed that would happen because there's quite a lot of detail um, in this. So I'm now going to just quickly wrap up by talking about what I was already going to kind of only spend a short amount of time on, which is the idea of solus Christus and sola Dea Gloria. So the idea of solus Christus is the idea of Christ alone, that salvation is by Christ alone, and that it is to the glory of God alone. Now, I think we've already seen in what I've said about salvation, that again, Catholics can happily say and do happily say, that we are saved by solus Christus, that we are saved by Christ alone. He is the sole meritorious cause of our salvation. I'm not going to go over that again. I don't need to belabor the point. So I don't think that anything within the, as it were, what in, in Catholic and Orthodox theology is known as the oikonomia, or economy of salvation. That's an unhelpful term because it has uh, commercial, in modern English, has commercial uh, allusions or, or connections. Um, that's not what we mean. Oikonomia in ancient Greek is literally means the law of the house. It comes from oikos, which means house, nomos, which means law. It's the law of the house. So the law of the new covenant. What is the means by which uh, within the new covenant we receive the grace of God and we receive salvation? Um, that's what we mean. Nothing in the economy of salvation is about meriting or earning, that is to say, in a strict sense, of the, salvation, the, the grace of Christ. So nothing in Solus Christus could apply in that sense to anything within the scheme of salvation that Catholic Christianity puts forward. But then you've got other things, and I'll go into them very briefly because I think we could go into a lot of detail that isn't really necessary. You can bring them up if you'd like to. I'm very happy to answer questions on these things. But for example, um, people talk about um, these things being in some way detracting from the idea that Christ alone is the, is the cause of our salvation or the, the means by which we are saved, and also detracting from the glory of God alone. Those being the priesthood. Uh, so for example, uh, people talk, refer to the fact that in uh, Catholic theology, we refer to priests as an altar Christus, as another Christ. We refer to them in, uh, um, within the Mass as standing in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. Well, I don't think that in any way detracts from the person of Christ, because what we believe here is that priests are ministers of redemption. That's all that we mean by priesthood. Priesthood is not in some way another priesthood alongside or, um, or in addition to the priesthood of Christ. If you look at the theology of priesthood within the Catholic Church, including in the Catholic Catechism, you'll see that it's very clear. In fact, there's a very good quote um, from uh, St. Thomas Aquinas that makes clear that priests are understood to be ministers underneath the high priest, who alone is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus himself is the ultimate high priest. He's the only one who can go into um, the, the most holy place and offer the only sacrifice that can be possibly made to God for the forgiveness of sins, which is his precious blood. What the priest does is minister that by representing the Christ, the, the, the sacrifice that Christ performed on the cross, and by being the means by which, sacramentally, we receive the forgiveness of sins, as we saw through uh, the apostles being given that ability to uh, forgive sins and to retain them. Um, that's the kind of role that the priesthood has within Catholicism. It's not in addition to Christ, and it's not competing with Christ. It's only because Christ exists and only because Christ has given his authority to his church and only because he uses as instruments his priesthood 
to actually affect these good things, these disgrace to his people and to the world, then in fact this can occur at all. This is in no way competing with the idea of Christ's sole mediatorship, of his sole priesthood, of his soul, uh, the, the only one, his being the sole means by which we are saved. There's simply nothing within Catholic doctrine that contradicts that concept. The, again, the priesthood is simply an instrumental means by which the sole meritorious cause and sole efficient cause, which is grace, can be uh, poured forth and communicated to his people. Purgatory indulgences is a slightly more complicated concept. Um, there we have the idea that there is the punishment that we are due to sin, that we are, that we are due, due to our sin, which is the eternal punishment of separation from God, which is hell. That's dealt with perfectly by what Christ did on the cross. But there's a secondary punishment that we do go through, which is the, what's known as a temporal punishment of our lives. And that's basically the justice within the universe as opposed to against God. Let's say, for example, that um, I killed someone. Let's say that I murdered someone. If I murder someone, then there is an eternal punishment for that. And if I don't repent, I will go to hell. Simple as that. And the only means by which I can receive the salvation of God is through the sacrifice he performed on the cross, through the means by which he established for that salvation to come through to me, which is the sacraments, and by, again, a lot of faith that works through love. But I've also got the temporal punishment for my sin, which is I will go to prison. And I should go to prison. That's a temporal punishment for, for my sin. And that's a, a part of, if you like, the, the cosmic justice that God applies in the universe. There could be other things. Even, even if I went to the confessional the next day, even if I went to the police and I, I um, confessed all of my sins as well, even if I performed all the justice that I could do and received gratuitously the grace of God uh, that will wash away the sin of murder that, that only he can, he can do, um, I would still have to go through the punishment of going to prison. So there is temporal punishment. And in fact, we see this within the scriptures. We see the idea, of, for example, when David sleeps with Bathsheba, he commits adultery with Bathsheba, he uh, uh, conceives a son. Also, connected to that, he sends her husband off to uh, be killed in battle so that he can have access to Bathsheba. Um, now, he repents of that sin later on. He, he asks for forgiveness from God. But after his forgiveness, God still punishes him on a temporal level. What's, how does he do that? By killing his son. His son dies. Now, that's an example where the eternal punishment that God has can be remitted, but the temporal punishment can still be instituted. So purgatory is not about eternal punishment. It's not about salvation. Anyone who talks about salvation with regards to purgatory isn't really, it doesn't really know what Catholic theology in this area is at all. The idea is that there is te there's a temporal punishment for our sins, that if we don't go through honour, we will go through in a place called purgatory. When I say a place, it's not really, that's a, that's again a, a misconception that I don't believe I've just, uh, I've just said. Purgatory not being a place, but rather being, uh, well, it's not described as a place, it's not even described as a process, it's simply mean, uh, described as something which we will go through after death, which will purify us of the remaining venial sins that we have in our souls, in other words, the sins that are not, um, that do not separate us from God, that we have not uh, been to confession about. Um, that, those will be purged from our soul, but also we will go through the temporal punishment due to the sins that we didn't go through when we were on earth. So this is a, a, something which comes very much within sacred tradition, uh, which is something taught very much by the church. Uh, it's developed more in the Western tradition, which is why the Eastern tradition doesn't really have it, although the Eastern tradition does have an idea of the idea of there being a final purification before death, uh, um, after death. So purgatory is the, the idea that there will be this final purification, and it involves suffering. That's it. That's the, that's the deduction of purgatory. It's not a belief in a literal fire. It's not a belief in, a, uh, in some kind of literal place of any description. It's just a, a, purgatory, a purgative process which we go through after death because of the temporal punishments due to our sin, uh, which will involve suffering. That's it. That's the fullness of the, do the deduction of purgatory. Now, indulgences are the idea that the church, because of the ministry that she has to uh, bind and loose, and because of the ministry she has to... Um, forgive and retain, that ministry, the ability of binding and loosing, can also bind and loose the temporal punishment that are due to individual sins. And so what she does is she attaches certain remissions of that temporal punishment to good works. So, for example, if I read the Holy Scriptures for half of at least half an hour a day, according to the Handbook of Indulgences, the Incoridian Indulgentiarum, so the Handbook of Indulgences that are uh, basically the uh, remissions of temporal punishment attached to certain good works, those will be remitted. Uh, those, those the temples, a certain amount of temporal punishment for me will be remitted by my doing that. In fact, um, under the right conditions, reading the Holy Scriptures for at least half an hour a day is an example of something I can do that would totally remit 
um, the temporal punishment for my sins. Well, that's what's known as a plenary indulgence, as opposed to a partial indulgence. Um, so there's no understanding um, of time within purgatory. Some people have that misconception because um, it used to be the case that there would be discussions of the remission of temporal punishment in terms of days uh, or months or, or years even. That wasn't referring to years, months or days spent in purgatory. It was, spent, it was actually used as a, as a, a, a unit of how uh, the punishment could be remitted or could be understood to be remitted because it was saying if you did an ordinary penance for one day, two days, three days, two months, whatever, then that's the equivalent value of this indulgence, if you like. So if you perform this good, pious action, whether it be prayer, praying of the rosary, reading the scriptures, whatever it was, then that would be worth, if you like, you having done normal penance uh, for several days or several uh, years or hours or whatever it was. That's where the idea of time came in. That has nothing to do with spending time in purgatory, which is uh, something people often misunderstand. Very finally, we'll talk about Our Lady and the Saints. This is simply a doctrine that develops from the idea of the communion of saints. So the idea is that we are all in communion with each other by virtue of our being, uh, those of us who are uh, in a state of grace, those of us who are part of the church, by virtue of that, we are in communion with each other. And being in communion with each other, we exist in a state of solidarity with each other. And we can pray for one another. And hopefully we do. I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ, for their blessing, for their protection, for their deliverance from sin, evil, temptation, things like that, um, for all sorts of different reasons. And that's part of my, uh, my duty, if you like, to my brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's no less a duty and no less a blessing that we have with the elect who are in heaven, with the communion of saints who are in the heavenly places, than it is on earth. You know, just as you can pray for me, uh, or as I can pray for you, so indeed we also have our Blessed Lady and the saints. Now, there are all sorts of areas I could talk about uh, with regards to our Blessed Lady. We have the, the, five Marian, um, the four Marian dogmas. We have um, the uh, developed idea of the Immaculate Conception, for example. But the idea within the early church was that Our Lady was, and you can go to my debate with Dr. James R. White in May, which is online, and you can see my presentation on this point. But within the Holy Scriptures and within Holy and Sacred Tradition, we see Our Lady described as many different things. We see her described as the Ark of the New Covenant, because, of course, she is. Um, there are several parallels between Luke 2 and um, 2 Samuel 6 and 7 um, that show her to be the Ark of the New Covenant. She, after all, did contain the manna, just as the Old Covenant, the Ark of the Old Covenant contained the manna um, from heaven and the rod of the high priest Aaron and uh, the tablets of the new law. So Our Lady contained the new bread from heaven, that is to say, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, she contained the new high priest, which is Jesus, and also uh, the new law, the founder of the new law, which is Jesus as well. So she's the Ark of the New Covenant. That's one um, scriptural uh, element of the teaching about her. There's also the idea of her being um, the daughter of the new Zion. There's also the idea of her being the queen mother of the, new, of the kingdom of God, because after all, the queen, the queen in the Old Testament was not the wife of the king, it was in fact the mother of the king. And of course, if our Lord Jesus Christ is the king of the new kingdom of God, then of course Our Lady is the queen mother of that as well. And in the early church, you see development of, this, of these ideas and also development of the idea of her as Theotokos, the, the God-bearer, uh, literally the one who bears the one who is God. And we see prayers to her, uh, the, the word involving the word Theotokos from the third century, as early as the third century. Um, we also see uh, the belief in her perpetual virginity. We also see the belief uh, later on developed, um, but, uh, but very much taken throughout the Christian diaspora without controversy, the idea of her assumption into heaven. And later on, only in the West, we see this idea of her being uh, immaculately conceived, but that follows on from the idea of her being um, the, uh, not just simply the aparthenos, the ever virgin, but also the um, panagia, the all holy one. So this idea of her being all holy, that she was without sin, is something actually shared by the, the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox, the Oriental Orthodox as well. These, are, these Mariological concepts are there throughout the Christian diaspora. And again, they're hardly contro contro controversial. The um, assumption isn't controversial. The idea of perpetual virginity is only denied by people who are readily um, identified as heretics. For example, the Antideca Marianites um, in the fourth century, the, the Helvidians, people like that. These are people who are immediately identified by the church across the board as heretics. Um, so this idea of Mariology, again, going back to what we originally said about uh, the development of doctrine, about scripture and tradition, we see Mariology being something very consonant with Holy Scripture and very consonant with sacred tradition and developed by the church. And not just 
the Roman church. I know people like to refer to the Roman church as if uh, Rome alone did these things. But no, uh, if you go to Constantinople, if you go to Alexandria, if you go to Jerusalem, if you go to any of the other apostolic sees, any of the other ancient churches, these again, whether they were in communion with the Catholic church or not, and the Catholic, the uh, Oriental Orthodox break away in 451 AD, the Syrian church of these breaks away in 431 AD, the Eastern Orthodox break away from the Catholic church or engage in schism with the Catholic church in 1054 AD. These are churches, particular churches, Christian churches, that share these beliefs about our Blessed Lady. Um, this is not Rome. This is the church Catholic over time. And again, we believe that the Holy Spirit guides the church in its fullness to that truth. And with regards to the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox, the fact that they believe these things is evidence that this was in fact a, the, um, something which goes right back, right back into the ancient past of, of Christianity, not something which is simply a late tradition, something um, added on by people. Because uh, if it were, it would be a very localized thing and it would be controversial, but it's not. It's a universal thing and it isn't controversial at all. And so finally, again, the saints, um, the idea of the saints is, again, that they are in communion with us and they can pray for us. Um, is this idolatry? Something that's very uh, often uh, accused, people accuse Catholics of engaging in idolatry when it comes to praying to Our Lady and the Saints. No, it's not, because idolatry is the identification of a thing as God and the service and the prayer to that thing as God. That's not what's happening with Our Lady and the Saints. It's very, very explicit within Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox um, theology that Our Lady and the Saints are below Christ, they are in service to Christ. They, uh, the only reason they have any blessing or any status at all is because of Christ and their role with Him. So all that happens with the Our Lady and the Saints is that we believe just, just as we have an effectual prayer line that our, uh, our, um, uh, our intercessory prayers have, act, have, uh, have worth, have effect, so do the prayers of the saints. And that's the reason why we ask them for their intercession as well. And that's something which has been, again, an historic Christian pra practice. Um, it's only been rejected by a few people in the West, and that's Protestant Christianity. Um, so does this in some way detract from the glory of God? No, it doesn't. Because ultimately, what do our Lady and the Saints do? They go through Christ. They go through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing that they, no prayer that they get uh, sent to the Father. If they sent a, a, a prayer to the Father without Christ, it would be of no worth, zero worth at all. It is only through Christ alone that they can, in fact, receive any kind of, um, any, any kind of benefit for us. And again, that's to the glory of God alone, because the glory of God is not something which is, a, is, is, a, is in a, a state whereby any glory we are given or any glory that the saints are given is somehow detracting from the glory of God. If, as we saw earlier on, God crowns his merits by giving us extra grace, then any glory given to the saints is simply the crowning of the merits that God gave to the saints themselves. In other words, they're his merits. Glorifying the saints, giving veneration to the saints, honoring the saints' mer mer uh, memory, is honoring what God did in them. Because it's only what God did in the, the Virgin Mary, it's only through what God did in the Virgin Mary that we can give her any kind of honor at all. We're giving her honor. We're giving her honor because of what God enabled in her and did through her. The same thing is true of all the saints as well. So I think we see a very different uh, approach to theology by Protestantism to, Christi to Catholic Christianity. And I'll just, I'll just finish on this point because I've now really gone over and I want to make sure that we have enough time for some good questions. So I apologize if I've taken up a bit too much time, but hopefully this has been helpful in clarifying these questions. I actually think that the approach that's taken by Protestant Christianity in comparison to that taken by Catholic Christianity is a kind of rationalistic archaeologism. What you see, by which I mean, when you, when you uh, see Protestant uh, theology taking place, what it is is mining the data of Holy Scripture and trying to recreate Christianity based on the limited data therein as if the scriptures are giving us a fulsome picture of what the early church looked like. But of course, the, the scriptures are not doing that. They never were meant to do that. The Holy Scriptures were meant to operate within the context of the church and in conjunction with the sacred tradition, as we saw with the canon. So when you take the Holy Scriptures alone and try to use that as a means of the divining uh, church government, for example, or how the sacrament should be applied, or, or anything like that. What you're engaging again is, is a kind of rationalistic archaeologism. Archaeologism means that you're going back into the past and trying to recreate history based on the limited data therein, which you can't do. And it's rationalistic because it engages in your own rationalistic uh, systematization of this data. That can't work. That's, not, that's kind of a naive view of history. I think actually it makes more sense to accept the way that Christianity has evolved and developed over time. 
And we can know whether or not there have been abuses added into that development by comparing what has, what has happened within the church now compared to what has happened before. If we see a continuity going from the early church to us today, for example, with the devotion to Our Lady and the Saints or with the Eucharist or whatever else, then we can know that that's a continuity, that there is a, a, a genuine development and an evolution from authentic Orthodox sources. But if we see something which is totally new, which is a total addition, which contradicts what has gone before, then we can know that that is heresy. Then we can know that that is not Orthodox, but it is an addition that has come in. Um, we cannot have um, an idea that a systematization of the, of the scriptures alone can really come up with a fulsome uh, theology. And I think that uh, one of the things that I find ironic, and I'll end on, on this point, is that in the scriptures, when we look at the textual history of the Holy Scriptures, one of the things people do uh, in, in Protestant theology, which I think is quite admirable, is, def is defend the, um, the integrity of the scriptures. Um, against people like uh, Bart Ehrman, by looking at the tenacity of scripture over time, by which they mean, they look at the textual tradition, and they look at the textual traditions um, coming from the Anglo-Alexandrian tradition and other traditions around the Christian diaspora and compare them, and say, look at the tenacity of the text. Look at the consistency of the Holy Scriptures in all of these different texts, these thousands of Latin and Greek and uh, Arabic and uh, Coptic and Syriac manuscripts over time. Look at this continuity. Look at this uh, tenacity of Holy Scripture over time. Look at its consistency and see, therefore, yes, of course we have the text of Holy Scripture. There are maybe additions and accretions here and there, but we can compare all of these different manuscripts and we can see, yes, there is a continuous and a consistent and an integral scriptural transmission and tradition over time. I find it really ironic that that argument is used by uh, certain apologists to defend um, the integrity of the Scriptures, but it's not used to defend the integrity of the holy tradition. Because again, if I do exactly the same thing, with, whether it be Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, um, Assyrian, uh, Oriental Orthodox, teachers, bishops, theologians, writers across time, I see a continuity. I see exactly the same kind of tenacity of tradition. I see a belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. I see baptism regeneration. I see the threefold order of bishops, priests, and deacons. I see that continuity of the whole Christian religion, which basically is the Catholic religion, over time. What I don't see are any of the things that, that characterize what is modern day Protestantism. I don't see uh, services which lack a sacramental aspect or lack a priesthood. I don't see um, a belief in a symbolic understanding of baptism, a symbolic understanding of the Holy Eucharist, or a denial of uh, five of the seven sacraments. I don't see any of that. What I see in historic Christianity is exactly the Christianity that I practice as a Catholic Christian. Christianity that is practiced in the third and fourth and fifth and sixth centuries is the Christianity basically that I practice today. But it's not the Christianity that is practiced, in, that as far as I can see, by Protestantism today. Now, you might not think that's a problem, but it seems to me that it's deeply uh, lacking in credibility to believe in a system that is so divorced from the majority of Christian history, which should have been guided, as the Holy Spirit promised, by the Holy Spirit himself. And you can try to say that there was a um, a remnant, a happy remnant of, of individual believers who, who practice the, the purified uh, Christianity of the scriptures um, right up until the Reformation, uh, or at least right up until, the, you know, let's say, the Waldenses or one of the early proto-Protestant movements. But I'm sorry, there's no historical evidence for that. And that, to me, forms a, a real lack of credibility on the part of, of the Protestant tradition compared to the Catholic tradition. So in looking at these five concepts, in looking at sol scriptura, sola fide, sola uh, gratia, sola, sola Christus, and sola dea gloria, and just looking at the way that the development of these teachings has happened and looking at the internal logic of them, I hope we see, on the one hand, what the true differences are between us, that they are important differences, that we should be debating them, but they are not the caricature that we've often found on both sides. You are not Antinomians and we aren't semi-Pelagians. Uh, you don't believe uh, that the works are important and we don't believe that works strictly merit our salvation or anything like that. We need to be very careful to properly define what differences are, be careful to rightly dialogue with each other, but also then to look at history and see which of these two systems marries most with the data of Holy Scripture, yes, but also sacred tradition and Christian history more broadly. And in my opinion, the answer that will come to that is it's the Catholic theology of the Catholic Church. On that point, I will end. I'm sorry it's taken so long, I, um, but I realize that I think this is a very, very deep uh, uh, subject, a set of subjects that I've only been able to really give a survey on. You can tell how long I would have gone for if <laughs> I've been going into greater detail. Hopefully that was helpful. And so by all means, let me know any questions you may have.
Thank you, uh, Peter. Do you want to maybe uh, unshare your screen at this point? Just hit the button at the top of the screen. Okay, stop share. There you go. There you go. So, yeah. folks, this is the interactive portion of the program. Uh, if you'd like to talk to Peter, then simply raise your hand and I'll promote you to be a co-panelist. Please keep your questions respectful, even if you vehemently disagree with everything he has said. Um, you can also submit questions in textual form by hitting the Q&A button also at the top of your screen. Uh, we have quite a lot of submitted questions and we also have one hand raised. So let me bring up um, our first hand. Hey, Cody. Hello. Wow, I have to go on so fast. Huh. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess my question uh, was, well, first to start off with, in your view, Peter, when was the first, because you went on about the canon and how we know the canon because the infallible church tells us what it is or something to that effect. Uh, in your view, when was the first time this happened? Well, I don't, I, I will clarify that. I don't think that we know it by virtue of the infallible church. My, my argument was not that we know the canon only through a magisterial statement by the infallible, um, extraordinary magisterium. So, for example, people often think that Catholics are arguing. Actually, maybe some Catholics are arguing that uh, there was a papal statement at some point, or there was a general council that was, convert, was convoked and made a decision. Actually, no. Um, there are two forms of magisterium in the Catholic church, as we understand it. There are, there's the ordinary magisterium, and the extraordinary magisterium. The extraordinary magisterium are papal definitions, um, which are very rare, or uh, general councils. So ecumenical councils like the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Trent. Now the first formal setting down of the canon by an extraordinary council would have been something like, I think the Council of Ferrara Florence in the 14th century, uh, or 15th century rather, um, or later on in Trent. But that's not what we take to be um, authoritative, first off. What we take is the ordinary magisterium. So the ordinary magisterium is the consistent teaching by the bishops over time. So when we see that there is a particular canon accepted by the church in ordinary Christian practice, hence ordinary magisterium, we take that to be an expression of the Holy Spirit guiding the church towards this consensus, what's known as the census fidelium, uh, the sense of the faithful, or the, the consensus of the uh, church Catholic. And when that happens, that's authoritative. That is infallible, in fact. There are many things we would believe, we believe is infallible, prior to them being uh, explicitly defined within an extraordinary council. So in my opinion, the first time that would have happened would have been that the consensus that, was uh, uh, that arose around the canon in the late fifth, no, late, late fourth, early fifth century, I'd say. Okay, so what about in all the centuries before that? Like, how did... Is, are you saying that because there was a consensus, a general consensus on the canon, that therefore people could have known what it is in those centuries before all that? Or am I misunderstanding you? Well, there's a difference between what becomes dogmatically uh, certain, if you like, and things that we are simply taught in any case. So, if, as I said earlier on, prior to the consensus that's arisen around the uh, late 4th, early 5th centuries, we actually find that the, the canon is debated. So again, Hebrews onwards, everything from Hebrews onwards is debated by the early church. They're the anti-legomena. There are books that are certainly uh, controverted because people aren't quite sure where they came from. Where they came from. So for example, Hebrews, to this day, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Um, there's a long-standing uh, hypothesis about uh, Paul being, uh, having bang been written by Paul. But ultimately, it's not something which they had any certainty about. So consequently, it was controversial. Some people accepted and some people didn't. What happened then was the church had to arrive at a consensus, and she did. And so at that point, one could say that the ordinary magisteria had made a discernment, and at that point, that's when the, the canon is, as it were, fixed for us, um, in terms of at least of the New, Test New Testament, and I think also the Old Testament as well. Um, but I don't think that prior to then that meant there was no orthodoxy. I think that there was a consistent, there must have been a consistent amount of Christians who did believe in the full 27 uh, book and 46 book um, canons of the Old and New Testament, respectively, and therefore that was what was accepted eventually over time. But what we have faith in is that the Holy Spirit guided the Church Catholic to that discernment. So you don't need a Pope, and you don't need a Council, but what you do need is the sense of daily. And that's expressed in the ordinary magisterium of the Church. Uh, okay. that... uh, oh, I'm sorry. What... Yeah, so I, I guess relating to that a little bit, um, would, I know James White's kind of asked you this question, like, I, would you sort of, would that be, a, would that answer be the same answer you'd give in terms of uh, a Jewish Jewish people before Jesus came? Because I know James White has asked you the question before, like, how would a Jewish man 
living 50 years before Jesus know that the Old Testament canon would that basically be the same answer you'd give for that or I'm, well, I'm, well, uh, if, you, if you watch my debate with James R. White on Mary uh, which was in May uh, it's online now uh, you can actually see that during the uh, audience question and answer period he makes that point and I answer it directly afterwards which is to simply say if you're going to ask me how did the Jewish believe and know what was a kind of Jewish scriptures very easy tradition and the reason I can say tradition is because how did the canon get uh, passed on to the Jewish believers well it was through the community of the Jewish faithful over time the community of the Jewish faithful accepted certain books as canonical and certain books as not now is that infallible certainly not I don't think it is infallible it didn't need to be infallible uh, all it really needs to be. I think this is where we get into the sticky territory. People think that Catholics need to believe there was some kind of infallible pronouncement. They don't. Uh, Catholics don't need to believe in infallible pronouncements from the chair, from a general council. All we do need is the, the, the what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, the testimony, rather, the testimony of tradition. And what a Jewish believer would have done is he would have accepted whatever books were given to him by his community. And that would have been also a, a great degree of influence by the Jewish priesthood. The Jewish priesthood would have had a great degree of authority in recognizing that. But ultimately, throughout whatever process it was, it would have been through a consensus within the Jewish faithful, however that came about, whether it be through the priesthood, whether it be through popular acceptance or whatever. And then that became part of in, uh, encrusted consensus. That became tradition because it was passed on. And you as a Jewish believer, if you're a Jewish believer in the, the 5th century BC or 4th century or 3rd century, would have accepted whatever was there within the temple, or whatever was there in the, in the synagogue. Um, so it was not infallible, no, it didn't need to be, but it was through tradition. And that's exactly the means by which it would have happened within the church as well. And it only became, as it were, an infallible thing when it became part of the ordinary magisterium. And then later, when it was controverted by heretics, it was then conferred, um, confirmed within an extraordinary council. In order that there would be total unanimity and total um, certainty amongst faithful who might otherwise have been misled. That's, that's exactly the way doctrine and dogma have always been generated. Just as we, I mean, a, a good example, a good analogy, analogy would have been with the Trinity, okay? Um, we believed in the Trinity prior to the Council of Nicaea. We believed in the divinity of Christ prior to the Council of Nicaea. But the reason why the Council of Nicaea made the decisions that it did at that time was because there was a sufficient amount of people controversing, in fact, at one point, the majority of the Christendom, controverting the, the idea of the divinity of Christ that there needed to be specificity and clarity and, and certainty on a magisterial level about that question. So it's not that we didn't believe it, it's that it needed only at that point to be made absolutely magisterially clear. Okay, so if, if we don't need an infallible pronouncement, and I'm, I, I say that because you, you, some Catholics, by the way, have argued to me that we need an infallible pronouncement, but if you're not, then okay, cool. I guess then if, if, we, doesn't, if we don't need some infallible church or whatever you want to define it then i don't know what's wrong what's what's the problem then like couldn't a protestant just say yeah why, why can't a protestant use a somewhat similar answer well we don't need an infallible pronouncement right but we all just merely recognize what the canon is the general community and that's kind of all we need i'm probably not well, actually that. when you when you do that you become very catholic <laughs> because what you're doing is you're accepting tradition uh, well, the only reason you accept uh, the canon of scripture is because you accept sacred tradition. You don't accept it from the scriptures alone. There's nothing within the Holy Scripture that can give you the full canon. There's nothing in the Holy Scripture that can give you the, the, the book of Jews as a book of the New Testament. You rely on the tradition that comes from the early church. So that's an example of accepting scripture and tradition. Now, the only reason why there is a role for the magisterium here, and the only way I would be convinced to say that we need infallible discernments, is when there's controversy, uh, controversy that leads to a need for certainty on a magisterial level. So the reason why the church makes any pronouncements, generally speaking, the church doesn't make pronouncements uh, on doctrinal issues because it tries to allow for as much uh, latitude in belief as possible. For example, uh, in the Catholic Church today, um, there is, a, there is a, a continuing discussion, which has continued ever since the 16th, yeah, about the 16th century, uh, about the nature of predestination. Right? So you've got a Thomist who would say that uh, God pre-moves the will of the believer. You might have a Molinist. There aren't any Molinists left in the Catholic Church. Ironically, they're more in Protestantism. But, um, they who would say something like, oh, well, no, it's, uh, it's based on God's uh, foreknowledge of the merits of the individual believer, that he gives them the grace to come to him in the first place, blah, 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 all of that sort of thing. Well, I can hold either position as a Catholic. The Church has made no pronouncement on it. The Church allows me to believe either of those two things. But the only reason why the church makes any pronouncement at all 
is when it's important enough that there be uh, consensus and that it's important enough that there be certainty about a controversial issue and where there's significant enough data within holy scripture and sacred tradition to come to an actual uh, discernment. There isn't enough to come to a discernment on the, on the issue of how God uh, goes about election. There isn't enough data within holy scripture or sacred tradition. But there is about the holy canon, and the canon is of such importance that when it was controverted within the 16th century, the church decided, no, no, we really do need to make a discernment here. Just as on a local level and in a more informal means, the church needed to come to a decision about the canon because there was this dis whole dis debate and discussion about the anti legomena and the future of canonical texts within those centuries. So insofar as we need infallibility, we need it only insofar as there are going to be controversies that, that eventually need to be terminated, this, eventually need to be ended, where there's no more uh, room for diversity on this point. The church says, no, for the good of souls, we need to make a decision. So that's the only time when infallibility is needed. What we don't need infallibility for, what we don't need magisterial statements for necessarily, on an extraordinary level, mark, mark that, extraordinary level, is when we have, is just to simply know what the canon is. I think you as a, as a Protestant, if you look at uh, Christian history uh, with enough open-mindedness and enough knowledge and enough rationality, you will be able to come to a decent conclusion about what should be the state of the New Testament canon. It's, funnily enough, <laughs> the New Testament canon we have today. Um, obviously, the Syriac Orthodox Church would have disagreed with you up to a certain point, and the Jewish Chronicle texts are another matter entirely, but all of that is something that tradition alone would bring you to. But again, tradition doesn't necessarily become sufficient when it comes to controversies later on, and that's where infallibility comes in. Uh, yeah, I, I guess the last thing I'll say is, uh, you know, when you said accepting traditions to be Catholic, like I have no problem with tradition. I just don't think that tradition is necessarily infallible. That'd be the other difference. And I would, I guess I'd, I assume, are you familiar with Michael Kruger? I am familiar with Michael Kruger. Yeah, yes. In fact, uh, Dr. White very kindly gave me a book of his uh, after the, our debate on Mary. Visited. Yeah, I'm aware, I'm aware. Yeah, yeah. I'm aware of the arguments uh, surrounding uh, Dr. Kruger. Um, the, the simple thing is, I think that a lot of the debate around this misunderstands the role, um, as I've hopefully just explained, about the role of the magisterium and also the, the critique that's being made when we refer to the, to the canon. The, 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 the argument that I would make and that I have made is not that the canon exists and therefore we need the church on an extraordinary level. My argument is that Sol Scriptura is undermined and disproven by the canon because Sol Scriptura says that the scriptures are sufficient to give us all that we need but we need the canon, but the scriptures can't give us the canon. In fact, the canon is something which we get through tradition. So when you accept tradition, you implicitly deny the sufficiency of scripture, because if you had a scripture that was sufficient enough to give you the canon, you wouldn't need tradition at all. Um, I'm not saying that the Protestants don't respect tradition. I'm not saying that Protestants don't accept tradition or that can't learn from tradition or can't value tradition. What I am saying is that when you find a tradition that you need and that has a, a datum that you need that you cannot find within the scriptures, the sufficiency of scripture is thus disproven, and that undermines, therefore, the entire epistemological edifice of Protestant theology. Okay. All right, well, I mean, I don't want to stay on for too long. I want to give someone else a chance, but uh, as much as I could keep on talking about this subject for quite a long time, but yeah, oh, sure. I, would, I, would, I would love, yeah, um, do you have like a, I probably should know this already, though, but do you, uh, if you have like a blog or something, I don't know, do you ever plan on, I'd love to hear one day you express in some medium your thoughts on Michael Kruger's argument, especially since you said James White gave you yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Well, do you know, funny enough, I've, I've just thought about starting up a blog, and I'll try to do that. The problem is that I have a day job, and I only get to do this in the evenings. Um, so I'm not a full-time apologist, and being not being a full-time apologist means that you can't necessarily spend as much time as you'd like on these questions. But what I do want to do eventually is start a blog. I've, I mean, I've got the blog. Start putting stuff up on the blog that will review things, that will discuss things like Dr. Kruger's arguments. And that will also discuss other things that people like Dr. White or uh, Matt Slick or uh, other people like that uh, come up with. Uh, so for me, this is an occasional ap uh, apostolate at the moment. I'm hoping to make it more of a continual thing. But that, it's a great suggestion. Thank you very much, Bert. And if you do want to engage by email or anything, do, do give me a contact uh, on Twitter and Facebook. I'm very happy to engage on a, pri a private level. All right. Oh, well, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cody. Um... Okay, we don't have any hands raised, but we do have submitted questions. Um, uh, may I ask, by the way, before we go to some other questions, um, on the topic of sola scriptura and your mm -hmm. critique that okay, so we don't get the there's no there's no sort of listing of the canon of the books that make up the New, New Testament canon or the Old Testament mm -hmm. canon. Um, surely, 
the at least the law and the prophets and the Psalms are affirmed by Jesus. So you get that material. And then you also have quite a bit of the New Testament from, for example, in Second Peter 3, 15 and 16, Peter affirms that Paul's letters are scripture. Um, and then we not have... Which letters are Paul's, but yeah, sure. Sorry? Not, not which letters are Paul's, but yes, he does, he does affirm the general principles sure. that Paul is being recognized by the early Christian community. Yeah, sure, absolutely. and I, I think we can make an argument that all 13 letters in the canon attributed to Paul are Pauline, and that would be based on I internal agree. clues and so on. Um, and we can also That's make so an argument... Sorry? We're so conservative. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually think all, all 13 letters including the pastorals and including yeah. Colossians and Ephesians and, and so on Absolutely. I think we can make a very good argument that these are all Pauline um, I agree. and okay, so Peter affirms that the letters of Paul are scripture and then 1 Timothy 5.18 affirms that Luke's gospel is scripture and we can also make an argument uh, internally with John's gospel in John chapter I think chapter 15 John says that the, or Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance all things that I have taught you. And in John 2, it says, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, then the disciples remembered the things that he had said, and then they believed the scriptures and so on. Sure. So you've got quite a well, bit of the... Books, sure, Sorry. but there are books, for example, like Esther that are not quoted. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other books that are not part of the scriptures that are so, uh, sort of uh, alluded to and mm -hmm. cited by our Lord and by the apostles. So, so the logic there follows to a certain extent. It doesn't, however, give us A, all of the... Old Testament or all of the New Testament and if it did if we were going to go only by the we were going to use internal clues like that consistently then we might even accept books which we don't formally accept as canonical right. um, which is why I think we rely not on the scriptures alone and the internal evidences therein although I do agree that they are important we need to make uh, make uh, take uh, care of those particularly because of an, on an apologetic level apart from anything else when, when uh, modernists try to to deny them for example um, I don't think they're sufficient, however, to give us the whole canon, which is why, again, I, I say this is a matter of tradition fully, uh, not really only about a matter of trying to look at the internal evidences. Though I say, I think they're important, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think, I mean, the early church seemed to have used certain criteria by which they determined which books were canonical or not canonical. Mm -hmm. So apostolicity obviously had to be written by an apostle or someone closely associated with an apostle. You have. Um, orthodoxy so as to contain orthodox doctrine um, and then there was catholicity so it had to be universally accepted as canonical well there you go that that's see that's the point the catholicity bit is the is the kicker um, because that's the point where you accept the census for daily and that's the point where you accept tradition right because it's, it's it's the it's the catholicity of the texts that was the basis i think primarily for their being accepted because again we didn't know the apostolicity necessarily of um of hebrews uh, you could make a very clear case for the orthodoxy of plenty of early church documents that were accepted by some as um, as canonical documents, but we know we don't any more take that uh, take that mm -hmm. at all, like the Didache or Shepherd of Hermas or things like that. Um, you, however, mm -hmm. Catholicity was was the kicker. That was the thing that really determined, I think, the full canon, and that is effectively an appeal to tradition. Mm -hmm. and but, you, but you can determine i think by internal evidence in hebrews that whoever wrote hebrews was closely associated with paul hmm. and so that would fulfill the criterion of apostolicity that's arguable um i i'm i don't know what i think about that yet i will I'll, i should I'll, I'll have to eventually get back to you on that but i'm not in, i'm not necessarily convinced um, I, i'd be happy to accept an argument um but i'm not uh yeah i'll have to to get back to you. And also, what, when, when I'm sure you can do that with. Um, <laughs> when when one reads Hebrews as well, one cannot help but be struck by the parallels between Hebrews and First Clement, and um, I think there's some very striking literary parallels in the vocabulary yeah. as much as very strikingly yeah. similar. And Clement, we know, was was associated with Paul and Peter. He was appointed bishop of the church in Rome by such, according to Irenaeus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That that's a strong argument that's made. It's it's a very interesting one. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, first uh, uh, Hebrews, um, uh, he Hebrews five and First Corinthians three. Also, Paul uses the same, uh, or he, the author uses the same illustration of needing milk, not solid food, which suggests that they're linked in some way, even yeah. if Paul's not the not the author. But um, that, that's possible. It could just be a trope as well that was sort of just used. It, you know, again, a lot of these are very arguable. I want right. to have um, very strong reasons for. If, before I made an argument in a debate, for example, I want to have very strong reasons. 
Um, so that's that's my yeah sure. I, sure. I do I do accept that. I do accept the points you're making. Yeah. In regards to the criterion of Catholicity, um, the selection of these books was not something, of course, which is arbitrary, but based on good arguments that these are indeed apostolic in their authority. And so, uh, I mean, I could make a case for every single one of the 27 books in our New Testament that they are written by the individual that, to whom they were attributed. I all could right. make a very good case against all of the apocryphal writings like the, the Gnostic Gospels and so on, that they are not written by the individuals to whom they are attributed. And so there is no case for any of these books outside the New Testament that they should be in the New Testament. You, you've, you've chosen the easiest ones to go after there, though. The Gnostic Gospels are very late. Um, right. They're very easy to refute. What about things that are orthodox writings uh, that don't have any error within them, that were early church writings, um, but that, that some people accepted as canonical, but that aren't accepted by us today? Uh, say the Shepherd of Hermas or any of the writings of Clement or um, uh, the Didache, things like that. You know, these are, even if they're not first century, they are still early church writings that some accepted to be um, very close to the apostles or people who work very close to the apostles or that were certainly orthodox enough, um, authoritative enough. I don't think that simply um, the Gnostic Gospels alone wouldn't be a very good example. I think you'd have to take a wider view of some of the early church literature, apostolic level literature. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, what, we, what do we accept over time? We accept the consensus that the church arrived at over time. Uh, I don't necessarily think that I can rationalistically go back into history using the, the limited data that we have and, and arrive at a total conclusion based on the internal evidences thereof. I mean, I'd be happy to if I could. Uh, it would be very good for making debates against um, you know, mythics and people like that. But, um, sorry if that was derogatory, but I am being derogatory. Um, but yeah, I think that the Catholicity point, the point of the census for daily, for me, is, is the, the thing that really does over time convince or convince me that this is, these are genuinely uh, the books that form the authentic canon, because the Holy Spirit guides his church into that, ar the arrival of that, um, of that truth. But they don't arrive to that by scripture alone. Okay, let's move on uh, to a question from Steve Hayes. Um, he asks, Catholic apologists often proof text their positions from scripture, yet Catholics also say we need the teaching office of the church to interpret scripture. But that generates a dilemma. One, if they can interpret scripture independent of the magisterium, then they don't require a divine teaching office to interpret scripture. Two, if, however, the interpretation of scripture is dependent on the magisterium, then how do they establish the magisterium from scripture in the first place? The magisterium is true because scripture says the magisterium is true, and scripture says the magisterium is true because the magisterium says that what scripture says about the magisterium, how can a Catholic escape vicious circularity? Right, so I think there's a misunderstanding there about the role that the church plays in understanding scripture. It's not a matter of, I can only know what scripture says if I read a official commentary from the Holy Father or by a general council or by something like that. That's not the way it works. The way, the, the, way the, work, the church interprets scripture is reactively, not proactively. The church allows her children to read the scriptures according to their best lights as they can, as long as they don't go off um, the boundaries, you know, as long as they don't read uh, something which is contrary to unanimous consent of the fathers, for example, which doesn't mean literally every father. Unanimous consent meant that the, the majority consisted within the early church, um, as long as it doesn't also uh, contradict the magisterium. So the church doesn't have an authoritative magisterial uh, determinant of what it says in Hebrews 1.8. Um, it says when the church comes up against heresy, when the church comes up against error, she reserves the right to be able to define what this means. Also, we can say that when the church consist, uh, consistently uh, interprets a piece of scripture in a very specific way, um, then that's clearly the meaning of that text. So, for example, um, the John 3, 6 related to baptism regeneration, for example, would be a very good example. It's hardly, it's, it's almost always, if not always, interpreted that way within the early church, with every writer who, who deals with that text. So things like that. Um, so it's not a matter of, well, I can only come up with a scriptural argument if I have an official uh, magisterial document uh, that backs that up, which would mean that I'm interpreting the magisterium on the basis that I'm assuming the magisterium is authoritative um, in order to prove the magisterium is authoritative. No, that's not the way it works. Um, I, I can, as an individual Catholic, read the scriptures, and I should read the scriptures, freely, according to my best light, according to the best uh, lights of scholarship, um, in the most honest way I can, without necessarily needing to refer to any magisterial document. The only reason I need to use a magisterial document when I do 
is to make sure that I don't interpret things contrary uh, to orthodoxy. And I think that's the, that's the role that the Holy Spirit gave the church over time. The, the, church has, the church is used instrumentally by the Holy Spirit to make sure that her children do not fall into the various forms of error, her, her, error and heresy that they could fall into. Um, the, church, the church is meant to be there as a guide, as a shepherd for the flock of Christ. Um, that's the role that the church plays. So I think that Mr. Hayes has a flawed understanding of the way that the church works with regards to scripture. Okay. Alistair asks, as you mentioned, Catholicism teaches numerous things that are not in the Bible, nor even hinted at in it, and were not taught by Jesus or the Christians, example, Mary assumed into heaven and core redeemer, etc. Compared to those who want to 100% follow the Bible and only what Jesus and the apostles taught, how can Catholicism claim to be more authentic or true than that? Well, for a very simple reason that this, that Catholicism represents, Catholic Christianity represents that which was taught throughout time by the entire Christian diaspora. Um, now, it's not a simple uh, argument ad populum. It's not simply an argument from the majority. It's an argument that, based on what Scripture tells us about the church, based on what Scripture promises or the Holy Spirit is promised to the church by Christ within Holy Scripture, we can be confident that when the church comes to an authoritative decision about things and uh, a, 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 a consensus over time, if you like, a consensus daily over time, this will be authentic. The Holy Spirit does not lead his church into error but into the forms of truth. And it's almost, it's begging the question to say, well, that isn't in scripture. It, it doesn't need to be. I, I don't need the immaculate conception to be in scripture in order to believe it. I need to make sure it's not in contradiction with scripture. If it were, then obviously that would be a huge problem. But I don't believe there is a single Catholic doctrine that is in, in, in contradiction to holy scripture. If I did, then I would have a, a, a real problem. That's why there can be a debate between Catholics and Protestants. Um, but I honestly don't think there is a single teaching that is in direct, con in direct contradiction. Um, so I would say, look at not just Holy Scripture alone, look at the sacred tradition by which I mean Christian history over time, not just what the Roman church says, but also what is found within the East and within the Oriental part of the church as well. Um, and you find that there is such a continuity between those two areas, those three areas, that that continuity is proof that this is in fact orthodox. Um, because if it were not, then the things that uh, Protestants attack Catholics for would be things that would have been controversial very early on. Uh, they would have been things that were deeply, bitterly disagreed over. I mean, for goodness sake, the early church was so uh, rightly anal, as it were, about orthodoxy that they disagreed over the timing of Easter. Um, you know, the church went into a quasi-schism quasi over that in a time when they were under persecution from the Roman Empire. Um, at that time and afterwards, the church would have been in extreme stress had, let's say, the, the perpetual virginity of Our Lady or the Assumption of Our Lady or the real presence of the Eucharist or baptism regeneration or any of the things that Protestants find particularly controversial within Catholicism, we would find evidence of real knockabout debates on the level of the debates about, uh, debates like with the, the Coloridians or the anti or the, um, the various controversies over Christology. Uh, but we don't find any of that. That's very interesting to me. That seems to me to be indicative of the fact that if this were not true, it would be controverted. It would not be simply accepted across the board, across the entire Christian diaspora, all at the same time as orthodoxy. And that's exactly what you see with things as late as the Assumption of Mary, which I accept is late in terms of our historical evidence for it. But the fact that it's liturgically accepted in East and West and nobody raises an eyebrow um, is really, really strong evidence that this is in fact, yeah, no, this is orthodoxy. Um, because it's not controverted at all. It arises out of the full Mariology that has always been there. Okay. Um, Jonathan Hanna asks, what about when Athanasius said, vainly then do they run about with the pretext that they have demanded councils for the faith's sake, for divine scripture is sufficient above all things, but if a council be needed on the point, there are the proceedings of the fathers for the Nicene bishops did not neglect this matter, but stated the doctrine so exactly that persons reading their words honestly cannot but be reminded by them of the religion towards Christ announced in divine scripture. So, um, and he gives a source for that. So, what would you say to that? Well, I would say look at the context in which Athanasius is speaking. He's speaking in the context of the Arian heresy. And the point he's making is that he's making an apologetic point. This is a point of apologetic methodology. When you're arguing with an Arian in the context of uh, third, fourth century history, you're, you don't need to have a general council to prove them wrong. You can go to the scriptures alone. Now, I could say the same thing about baptism and regeneration if I'm arguing with a Calvinist. Um, I wouldn't need to go to a, a, a 
general, general counsel to make that point, I could go to exactly what Athanasius refers to there, which is A, Holy Scripture, and B, the testimony of the fathers, which the, the fathers of the councils did not, as, as I noticed he said, um, overlook. Those two elements are sufficient for establishing certain doctrines. And when it comes to Christology, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I need to go to the Council of Nicaea in order to debate a Jehovah's Witness on the divinity of Christ. I think the Holy Scriptures are perfectly sufficient enough to establish the divinity of Christ, the Trinity, things like that, things that are as basic as that to Christianity. I think the Scriptures are sufficient. But that's on a basis of, a post, of an apologetic methodology, not on the basis of broad church-level epistemology when it comes to the establishment of doctrine. There, I think there are some things that can be established by Scripture alone, again, back to regeneration or uh, Christology, things like that. And there are other things that can't, like the canon. Um, so we have to have a diverse view of different doctrines. It's not simply the matter that, oh, everything can be established by Scripture, or no, everything has to be tr established by the magisterium. No, it has to be established sensibly by Scripture, some cases only Scripture, by tradition, some cases only tradition, most cases by Scripture and tradition, and then eventually, when necessary, by the infallible magisterium of the church, when things are so controverted that the church needs to step in and say, okay, now we need to make a settled decision here. That's what the way that church history works. Jason McCool asks, why would I need Mary or any saint to intercede for me if Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them, quoting from Hebrews 7.25? If Jesus Christ's intercession isn't enough, what possibly could be? Well, it's not that our Lord's intercession is not enough. In fact, all that the uh, Our Lady and the saints are doing is interceding with our Lord on behalf of us, just as you and I, if we, if we were you know, praying, and I asked you to pray for me and you asked me to pray for you, I mean, why are we doing that? What's the point of praying for your fellow Christians? Why do you do it? Well, I think the reason that you do that is because you believe that within the providence of God, however it's meant to work, and I'm, I don't claim to know, uh, because I don't think we can know, I think it's a mystery, but however in the providence of God our intercessory prayers are meant to work, they do have an effect. They are efficacious. Not because they change the mind of God. That's not the way it works. That's something we can definitely rule out. But somehow in the providence of God, intercessory prayer is something that has some kind of effect. And therefore, we do it. Now, all that we say about Our Lady and the Saints is that Our Lady and the Saints are as close, or are in heaven, uh, are totally purified, are totally made just. Uh, Our, Lady and Our Lady was made just from her conception onwards, but our saints are made completely just in the normal way that we are. And so consequently, have that position before the throne of grace. So they go to Jesus and Jesus goes to the Father. Everything goes through Jesus. But it's not that Jesus' intercession is somehow uh, insufficient for us, though it's such that we need Our Lady and the saints, is that we believe that the intercession of the saints, that is, it includes the saints on earth, the church militant as well as the church triumphant in heaven, has an effect. And because I would pray, uh, because I would ask you to pray for me, I also ask our Blessed Lady, who is the mother of God, to pray for me to her son, who will go to the Father. In the same way that I ask St. Thomas More, or any number of other saints who are particular favorite saints of mine, to intercede for me on my behalf as well. Uh, exactly the same logic applies in both. Now, I just don't believe that the uh, communion of saints is ruptured by death. Quite the contrary. Death has no power over the saints of God at all. Such that, yes, in heaven, now that they are in heaven, now that they have uh, the glorified bodies that they have there, uh, now that they have the, uh, the direct relationship that they have with God in, in perfection, not just the direct relationship we have, the direct relationship they have with God in perfection that they have, uh, they can uh, um, intercede for us in very, very efficacious ways. And that's the reason why historically uh, Catholic and Christians have been asking the dead to intercede for them. You find, in fact, in I think it's the third century, we find the earliest, it might be the second, but I think, it might, I think it's the third, I think it's the third century. Um, we have the inscriptions of uh, Christians writing in Rome, in the Roman catacombs, to um, the, the dead, the martyrs, for example, asking for their intercession on their behalf. Now, why do you do that um, if you don't believe it has some kind of effect? So historically, Christians have believed this has an effect, and that's why we do it, not because it takes away from the sufficiency of Christ. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on your understanding of the story of the Witch of Endor and Saul consulting this medium to bring back uh, Samuel from the dead? Um, and every every time that we read in scripture of someone who's dead being contacted, it's condemned. What would you say to that? Well, that's necromancy. That's not saintly intercession. You're not asking someone who is in a uh, state of communion with God, uh, who is dead in the context of the economy of grace in the new covenant to ask to pray for you before the throne of grace, what you're asking for is some benefit from the dead in Sheol um, in a very kind of 
uh, mercenary way. That's simple necromancy. If you're trying to raise the dead, or if you're trying to, in, in that context, or if you're trying to gain some benefit from the dead that you've explicitly been told not to do, then I think that's necromancy rather than saintly intercession. There are two fundamentally different things. I don't think that the saints can raise the dead. I don't think the saints can uh, do things that they should not be doing that were contrary to the old law or that they're contrary to the moral law now. Um, I simply think they can do one thing and one thing only, and that is ask for uh, God's, uh, God's grace for us right now before the throne of grace. That's it. And it's exactly the same reason I, again, ask you to pray for me. I don't think you can do anything like that either. Um, is, is there any precedent or um, warrant in Scripture for doing so? None that I can think of. We do talk, there is a reference within, uh, I think it's Hebrews, I could be wrong, uh, to the great cloud of witnesses that we have. Where is that cloud of witnesses? Yeah, that's in, in Hebrews chapter uh, 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 11. That's it, that's quite right. Yeah, Hebrews 11, we have this great cloud of witnesses. Or Hebrews therefore, 12 even, sorry. Therefore, yeah, who are, who, are, who are therefore witnesses, who are, who are watching, witnesses in the sense of no. martyr, but also witnesses in the sense of watching us. So we have, for example, in Revelations, the idea of the saints, Holding the prayers of these people, holding the prayers of the, of the saints as incense before God, things like that, I think, are indicative. Um, I, th I think are sort of scriptural shadows and types of what we find explicitly within the practice of the early church when we go into the practice of the early church fathers. Yeah, I mean, uh, he Hebrews twelve uh, so opens. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, um, let us lay aside every weight and sandwich so clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, and so on. Uh, it seems like a bit of a stretch to get from that to praying to saints. Who are well, dead. I'm not making a basis for it purely on that. If, if I were, if I were saying cloud of witnesses, therefore prayers to the saints, that would be a good argument. But what I'm saying is that these are simply shadows and types these are things that are indicative and suggestive i think actually the the revelations uh, sorry revelation reference the apocalypse reference is more uh is more um more relevant than the cloud of witnesses reference uh, reference in this case but ultimately uh these are i think are indicative of what we see more explicitly found within the early church and again there's, there's no there's nothing that condemns it there's no example of early controversy about such a practice now if that were the case then that would be a very strong evidence against it um, but that's why we need to take the whole of the uh, data of, of history into as much as we have it. I mean, again, we have limited reference. Uh, we have limited data within the uh, earlier centuries. And we have less and less data as we go back. But I think that eventually there would have been uh, quite a controversy about this. And there simply isn't. Um, so that to me is indicative. What is the earliest source that you're aware of where this is alluded to? I think, again, the archaeological findings that we found within the catacombs. That's, that's the, one I'm, I'm, the one I'm most uh, I'm aware of. I'm happy for someone to say, actually, there's an earlier reference or there's more explicit reference elsewhere. I'm happy to be corrected on that point. But that's the one I, of which I am aware that is the earliest. So that would, be, okay. that would be third century. Okay, but can you make an argument for this being connected to apostolic authority? Not on that one, uh, not, not on the archaeological findings alone. I think that what you find is, again, the consensus throughout Christendom. So in other words, the fact that this is something which is just practice, the fact that people feel comfortable in, not just in the third century where we find a, a manuscript, there's one particular manuscript that I used in my debate with uh, Dr. White, which we have in the University of Manchester, I believe, which is the earliest, it's called the um, Subturn Presidium. It's the earliest, it's actually in Greek, um, but it's the earliest example of the Subturn Presidium, which is a prayer to our blessed lady, uh, invoking her as a theotokos, um, asking for her intercession uh, before us. And we pray the subterranean presidium today, to this very day. Um, so that's something that I think is very indicative. And, and I think that the fact that this is practiced by Christians so consistently over time is evidence of that. So I think that it, we have therefore direct evidence of it being apostolic. Well, if it were not apostolic, and if it were not something which the early church were happy with and thought was, was orthodox, then again, we would see controversy. And we would see that there'd be, there would be a, a large amount of the... the um, it would be very, or it would be very localized. Um, in other words, it wouldn't be a Catholic practice. It would be a local uh, heresy that was later stamped out. Um, but we don't find that. We find it something which just pervades the church Catholic over time. So that, to me, again, uh, is suggestive. And again, for, for a Catholic, as opposed to a Protestant, if a, a Protestant will say, if it's not found in Scripture, then I don't accept it. Or, uh, I mean, well, I'll, I'll be more precise than that. I have to say that Calvin's holds the regulative principle I know that Lutherans hold the normative principle. So the normative principle being that 
Um, it doesn't have to be in scripture, but it has to be consonant with scripture. Whereas Calvinists believe that no, it, it actually has to be expressly in scripture, otherwise it can't be accepted. Um, so I don't know what a, Cal what a Lutheran would say. I think a Lutheran would probably make some kind of argument that they think it contradicts the scriptures in some way. You'd have to ask them. But for a Catholic, it neither needs to be in scripture nor even implied by scripture. It simply needs to be something which is not contrary to scripture, but is practiced as part of sacred tradition. And that's why we accept it. Okay. So rattle through some more questions. Um, Callum says, does the Eastern Orthodox Church favor a double source theory? Mm -hmm. They certainly do. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's an easy one. <laughs> yeah, exactly the same epistemology, yeah. Um, and, and the Oriental Orthodox and the Assyrian Church of the East. Uh, Callum also asks, can you defend the church's position on transubstantiation without appealing to hylomorphic theory of substances? Well, by definition, no, because transubstantiation relies on a hylomorphic <laughs> theory of substances. Um, well, okay, perhaps uh, it's, there are some Catholic philosophers who would say, who are not Thomistic, who would say, okay, hylomorphism isn't expressly affirmed by uh, the church. You don't have to be an Aristotelian Thomist to be a Catholic. Yeah, okay, I accept that. That's true. Uh, I believe hylomorphism is true. In fact, if you want uh, good reasons for believing in hylomorphism, I would refer you to excellent philosophers like uh, Professor Edward Faser, uh, or um, I just remember his name. He, he, there was another English philosopher who wrote a book called Real Essentialism. He's at the University of Reading. Look at Real Essentialism, you'll find him. He's a very important modern philosopher uh, in this area. So I would happily defend hylomorphism. Do you need uh, to, to, to defend transubstantiation? It seems to me that, and this is my opinion, that transubstantiation is predicated on the theory of uh, the hylomorphic theory of substances and the idea of substance and accidents, and therefore it'd be very difficult to do so. You'd have to find an alternative philosophical schema that affirmed the same doctrinal content as transubstantiation. Um, but I would just simply point out that you don't need to believe uh, that in order to perform the affirm the basic doctrine, which is behind all of this, which is the real presence which is not the same as transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, just to clarify for anyone who, who's not aware, is the philosophical outworking of how the real presence works. The real presence is the belief that the bread and the wine and the Eucharist become the literal body and blood of Christ. Um, but obviously then people notice over time that well, the, the, the species of bread and wine, seem to, the outward appearances of bread and wine seem to remain. So consequently, how do we explain this? How do we explain that, yes, we believe on faith that there is a, a genuine change, that's happening. This is the total consistent uh, teaching of sacred tradition. It's very much affirmed by Luke 22, 19 and 1 Corinthians 11. So how do we therefore affirm that when the appearances don't change? Well, transubstantiation is the Western explanation of that, the Catholic explanation of that. And I would argue that it's in fact completely consistent with what the East would say. And the East would say, uh, not transubstantiation, but meta-usios, that's the word they use, which is as far as I can see, exactly the same word, just transpose one into one, Greek into Latin or Latin into Greek. So whether it's metaousios or transubstantiation, both are simply significations, and in the case of transubstantiation, explorations and, and, and expatiations of the simple doctrine of the real presence, which is very, very Catholic and totally orthodox. Okay, um, let's see. Jason McCool asks a question, which I think should be easy for you. He asks, I'm curious about what works in, um, charity or sacraments that the thief on the cross was able to fulfill to warrant being with Christ in paradise? Well, in that case, the church has actually over time come up with uh, the idea that uh, baptism uh, can be in three forms. It can either be baptism, water baptism, hydro baptism, if you like, baptism of water. That's the normative form of baptism. But there are two others. There's baptism of desire. Uh, I think that's baptismus fuminus. No. Uh, yes. Well, anyway, baptism of desire and baptism of blood. Baptism of blood is when you are martyred for the faith. Baptism of desire is when you die uh, before you get baptized, even though you desire baptism. Um, so in both those cases, the uh, I don't think you could argue necessarily that uh, the thief on the cross was martyred, although perhaps you could. You, you might argue that the thief on the cross is an example of baptism of blood. But you could also argue that, okay, he desired what would have been baptism had he lived prior to, you know, the uh, sorry, after the crucifixion. And therefore that's a form of baptism of desire. So he received a form of baptism uh, but the early church defined that as baptism of desire or blood as opposed to baptism of water. So it's not the case that God says, oh, well, you didn't make it to the font in time. Oh, dear. No, if you have faith, but the faith becomes a baptism of desire or a baptism of blood. 
So that's an extraordinary example of justification. But that's those are two things that the early church affirmed. Therefore, the church affirms that today. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, I also asked the question about charismatic gifts. <laughs> this is an interesting one. Why does the Catholic Church not have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, faith, healing, etc.? That the gifts end with the apostles, as some claim. And I'm a cessationist, by the way. Where, um, there, you that you're saying that? Or you're saying that? I'm saying that. <laughs> you're saying that, yeah. yeah. Where there have been Catholic um, charismatic revivals, but generally the gifts, such as speaking in tongues, faith, healing, etc., are not in the Catholic Church, i.e., not seen at every meeting or ma mass? Well, I, I'm afraid this is a very controversial question uh, for Catholics um, because there are ex exactly the same debate exists in, in Catholic Christianity as it does in Protestant Christianity about um, about the, the idea of the charismatic gifts. Now, my opinion, I know, I know a number of charismatics and I um, I'll say this there are lots of Catholic charismatics. So to answer your question, uh, why have the, why has the Catholic Church not got these gifts? Well, if they do have these gifts, they do. If, if these gifts do occur in in Christians, then they do occur in Catholics just as much as they do in, in Protestants. There is a very very large Catholic charismatic renewal. Now, my personal view on this is that I am not yet convinced. I'm willing to be convinced, but I'm not convinced of the uh, of the whole idea of this. There are two reasons for that. Person, there's a personal reason and a theological reason. The personal reason is that I've been to Catholic charismatic stuff. I've tried to uh, be open to the gifts, uh, including this idea of, of, of praying in tongues as well. And I'm not convinced that when I did it, I wasn't just sort of doing something uh, as opposed to actually being led by the Spirit or being prompted by the Spirit in some way. I'm not convinced this is just you know, not, not a thing at all. That's one thing, but I'm open to the idea that it is. It's just, that could just be me. You know, I have to have the humility to say that's just my experience. My experience counts for very little as far as I'm concerned. You know, so that, you know, you take that for what you will. The theological problem I have is that I don't see uh, in Christian history a use of the charismatic gifts in this way. It seems to secede, sorry, secede. It seems to cease at all completely uh, after the apostolic age. And we don't see examples of it at all. Uh, now, I'm willing to be convinced otherwise. I'm willing to be shown that there is historical evidence of a perennial use of these gifts over time. And that would be a very strong evidence for me of the, of the genuine authenticity of these gifts. Uh, I certainly think that healings, for example, happen. Um, I certainly think that a, a form of prophecy happens. So there are forms of these gifts that certainly does seem to exist after the apostolic age. People are healed in Christian history. And people are uh, g given sort of strong prophetic uh, of that sort of thing. But I'm not convinced that but the whole glossolalia uh, phenomenon, which appears to be the defining element of this whole phenomenon, weirdly, um, doesn't seem to be something I see in the rest of Christian history. There are some people who have uh, great pseudo-charismatic experiences of the Holy Spirit, you know, great experiences of the Holy Spirit giving them some profound gift. Like, for example, one of my favorites is St. Philip Neri. St. Philip Neri was in the 16th century. Um, miraculously, his heart, and we, we know this through the, the the medical evidence he had his body. Um, miraculously, his heart was expanded by the, the Holy Spirit. His, he was such a, a man of love that his heart expanded by the Holy Spirit, such that it, it actually cracked his ribs. You know, his rib pages cracked because he had such a large heart. And when people were on the pew with him, they could hear the thumping of his heart. It only had been enlarged over time. Now, that's a, an example of a miraculous, uh, sort of a, a greater spiritual experience of this person. But glossolalia just doesn't occur, occur. It doesn't appear in any of these things. And that makes me rather suspicious. If something is authentic and true, that it must have, an, over time, some basis um, in Christian history. Some perennial uh, example of this must be found throughout the, the beat of Christian history. And it's not. As far as I can see, I'm willing to be convinced otherwise, but I can't see it. And until I'm convinced that this is something which is a genuine part of perennial Christian experience, I find it very difficult to believe that the Holy Spirit would cease his gift or, would, or, or that people would just lose touch with him for, whole, for almost 2,000 years. That doesn't seem to me to be credible. Uh, so I must admit, I, I'm, I've got a lot of issues with that. Um, and I'm willing, again, open-minded. I'm not closed-minded on this point. I'm not an, I've not made a total decision to be a cessationist. But I lean in that direction simply because I'm sorry, the evidence doesn't point in the right direction for me. And 
the, the light by which God has given us uh, the means by which to come to these kind of adjudications is our, is our reason under the influence of the Holy Spirit using the evidence of scripture and sacred tradition. And I'm afraid that to me at the moment, it doesn't marry up to those. I agree <laughs> with that part. We agree on something at least. Hey, very good. Um, Jonathan Hanna asks, what about uh, Van Hooser's definition of Sola Scriptura? Biblical scholar Kevin Van Hooser rightly defines Sola Scriptura saying, Sola Scriptura means that scripture alone is the supreme normative standard of Christian faith and life. This means that scripture is also the norm and criterion for Jesus Christ. We have no other authorized and infallible testimony to Christ aside from the scriptures. Scripture is thus the norma, uh, normans, norming, norm, what we might also term the unnormed norm. Tradition is norma, normata, <laughs> normed, norm. Um, the normed norm of tradition has derivative or relative authority, what some have understood as ministerial as opposed to magisterial authority, and what I have here been calling testimonial as opposed to judicial authority. Hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting last bit. Um, so what I try to do in my uh, definition of Sol Scripture, which is, again, one which I found has been accepted when, when I defined this with uh, James R. White, he was quite happy to accept this definition. And other people, when I've used this definition, they've been happy to accept it. The idea that it is the soul, sufficient, ultimate, what we just heard there was the ultimate bit, infallible rule of faith. Right? So those, those four qualifications there, soul, sufficient, ultimate, infallible, do need to be there. As far as I've seen in the majority of Protestant um, explorations of soul scripture and attempts to explain and expound soul scripture, those seem to be the common elements, which is why I use them. I'm going by what most Protestants seem to have gone by. Uh, and I think that's the more uh, the right way to go about it, rather than using only one definition that only one person's given. Now, we've got, so that chat referred to the ultimacy of Scripture, and I'm saying that there is no basis for thinking that it is ultimate, the sole ultimate uh, root of faith in Holy Scripture. I don't believe, for example, that 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 works as a, a demonstration of that. It seems to me very curious that there is only one, absolutely allegedly explicit um and i don't think it's explicit at all um, expo ex um exposition of scriptural sufficiency or scriptural ultimacy in the whole of scripture you'd think that a, a, a doctrine as basic as that would give uh, would be given much more i mean maybe at least two or three you know, um kind of um, verses to sink your teeth into but in any case um the sufficiency of scripture is the thing that is that is the center of controversy here if scripture is not sufficient to function as our soul ultimate rule of faith and how can it be our ultimate rule of faith and then also again we have to look at the fact that script that christian history uses more than just scripture it uses sacred tradition and it uses the church as a magisterial and a, yes a juridical if you want a, a sort of judging um uh, element to it it uses the church as the instrumental means by which orthodoxy may be maintained given that uh, i don't think that there is any good reason to think or to believe in the ultimacy of scripture um, I certainly don't think, I think it's, we, we can absolutely disprove the sufficiency of scripture to give us all that we need. And on those bases, I don't accept sola scriptura. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I just think that it makes more sense of the scripture, it makes more sense of Christian history to see it as one of the key sources. Well, I mean, and when I say key, I mean crucial, absolutely authoritative sources, but which is part of that uh, system of scripture with tradition, which then feeds into the magisterial teaching authority and development of the church. That's, that seems to be the most sense that I can make. Jason McCool has a follow-up on the thief on the cross. He says, first time I've heard any reference to two other forms of baptism. So from where does this idea originate, scripture or tradition, early or late? Oh, it comes in tradition. So now, I don't know how early it goes. I'd have to do some research and find the earliest reference to it. Um, but that's certainly something which is there within the early church. And it's something I think that every, people of both the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox, and the Oriental Orthodox would probably accept based on the simple continual use of this. And it's a, in fact the way that, in fact, we do historically, people have explained the thief on the cross. Because the thief on the cross is an outlier. You know, it is an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, example of someone being saved outside the, norm the normative means of salvation. But we've already always accepted. I don't think anyone has not. Well, OK, that's not true. There have been some who've tried to say that there are very restricted means of salvation, that they aren't as wide as we have historically thought. I mean, in the 1940s, I think it was, there was a group of people called the Fenians who tried to say that unless, I think if this is the case, unless you're water baptized, you cannot be saved. You have, have, have to be water baptized. Um, there can be no exception. 
uh, elements. And I think the church said, no, that's not been historical orthodoxy. Um, so I think I'm getting that right. Um, so I think that the idea of baptism regenerate, uh, the idea of baptism regeneration is the normative means of salvation, but there being exceptional means of salvation as well, such as baptism of desire and baptism of blood, that goes back very far. It's not a very late development as far as I know. It's, it's certainly something which would be, I'm going to guess something like fourth, fifth century, but I'd go away and find it for you. And if you, if you send me, if so, if you contact me via Facebook or Twitter or something and say, here, I was a guy who asked that question, please, could you send me the source? I'd be very happy to find it for you. Okay. Uh, Callum asks, speaking speculatively, when do you think Peter was recognized as Pope? He doesn't seem to be seen as more authoritative by um, as more authoritative by Paul with the meeting in Galatians alongside James. Well, I think the word Pope is, um, is anachronistic. The word Pope is used later on. If you're talking about when was he recognized as having the authority he was given by Christ, I think he's given that authority very early on. The fact that Paul says, I withstood Peter even to his face, it sounds like something you wouldn't do to the Prince of the Apostles, you know, generally speaking. It sounds like something that, that was unusual. That, he, that Paul would kind of go that far as to kind of challenge Peter, rightly so. Uh, people think that what we think about the Pope is that, you know, you can't challenge the Pope, the can't, Pope can't be disagreed with, can't be wrong. It's never been believed by Catholics. That's a total, total um, caricature of Catholic belief about the papacy. And there's huge amounts. Um, I, actually, there's, there's a, because we've had a slew of very good papers, uh, papacies recently, uh, there's been a slew of, uh, of overconfidence, I think, in the role of, of the Pope. Um, rather than kind of the more sober-minded analysis we've had historically that the Pope um, has or in the terms of his role. But with regards to uh, his role in the, in the Council of Jerusalem, um, I think that what you see there is James as the Bishop of Jerusalem being the, the, the guy who just heads the meeting. But it is Peter's pronouncement that seems to be taken as authoritative within that meeting as far as I can see. So I'm not saying that what we find in the New Testament is exactly the same form of the papacy that we find now. Obviously, things have developed over time. Obviously, that you know, they don't wear the same things that they wear now uh, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament. Obviously, they don't have exactly the same juridical processes. They don't have sacred congregations. They don't have cardinals. I mean, cardinals uh, is, a, is an interesting example. The reason why we have cardinals is that cardinals are the priests of the bishops of the Diocese of Rome. They're given specific... Uh, their bishops were given specific parishes within the city of Rome so that they can follow the tradition whereby the Bishop of Rome was always elected by the clergy of Rome. Um, so that's why that happens. That's a development, but it's in continuity with what came from the very beginning. So I don't think that the form of the papacy that we see now is exactly what we find in the New Testament or in the early church. I think it does develop, but that's true of everything. Um, in, in the faith, there is literally nothing, I think, in either the Catholic faith or in Protestantism that is exactly as it was when we, when we look at the first century, partly because we just don't know what the forms were like in the first century, that we haven't got limited data, but also because it just wouldn't be. You know, history happens, development happens, things change, and uh, people make these kind of hopefully harmonious, going harmoniously with the past, um, additions over time. Not additions in the sense of accretions, but additions in the sense of growing and developing and evolving this thing, this, 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 this acorn, this germ, of this practice or this uh, institution or this doctrine and making it into its full self over time under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, um, if you're asking me when do I think the authority of Peter is recognized, I think it's, I think it's recognized very, very early on. I think it's recognized in the Acts of, in the, the Council of Jerusalem. I think it's recognized by Paul when he goes to uh, withstand Peter, even to his face. But I think that the full institution of the papacy is something that develops over time. Well, I don't think that. I, I know that. That's obvious from history. I, I, I can't hear you, Jonathan. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Alistair yeah. asks, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church teaches it is the one true church established by Jesus and the apostles. Are they wrong on that? And, on, and only the Catholic Church is the one true church or both are true? <laughs> well, they can't both be right. Um, <laughs> what we can say is that, um, so, okay, so the Catholic Church views the Eastern Orthodox Church, the um, the Oriental Orthodox and the Assyrian Church of the East, as what are known as particular churches, which is to say that they are genuine churches. In order to be a church, historically speaking, a true ecclesia, what you have to have is a bishop. Historically, that's, that's an absolute standard. You need to have a bishop in continuity with the apostles, in succession with the apostles. You also need to have the Eucharist. You need to have the sacraments that flow from the priesthood, from the bishop. Um, and the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox and the Assyrian Church of the East all have that. 
Um, now, historically, we might not have said that because uh, we would have said, well, certainly the Oriental Orthodox and Syrian Church of the East, because we misunderstood the Assyrians to be Nestorians, and we misunderstood the uh, Oriental Orthodox to be mono monophysites, when in fact they're myophysites. I'm not going to go into that difference right now because it's actually really technical, but uh, that, that means that they do affirm uh, what, we would have, what we would consider um, teachings that are in, in continuity with and in conformity with Chalcedon. Not in exactly the same... Um, uh, not in exactly the same formulation, but in terms of the fact that they believe in the humanity and the divinity of Christ uh, in, the, in, the, in enough in similar ways that we do, similar enough for their orthodox. So, so we would say that those are particular churches. However, in order to be part of the Catholic Church, and this is the reason why we use the word Catholic with regard to the Catholic Church, then the one thing you do need that they don't have is communion with the successor of St. Peter. And that's why we do think Matthew 16, 18 is important and not flowing on, flowing on from that also the role of the papacy within Christian history. We do believe that that basic standard um, of, of, if you like, the executive head of the church, that the one who is given the keys of the kingdom, the one who has the keys given to Peter, that is really, really crucial. That, that is absolutely basic to being Catholic, to Catholicity. And so that's why we would say the Catholic church is the one she chose church found in her fullness and that whilst the eastern orthodox and the oriental orthodox and the syrian church of the east are in a kind of communion with the catholic church they're not in full communion and that is why um, we would like to enter into full communion with them so over time hopefully by the grace of god that will happen um how it will happen is, is another question i don't think it's for decades yet by the grace of god if, if it could happen before the millennium or uh, anniversary <laughs> Uh, commemoration, if you like, of the separation between Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. I'd love that. Um, but ultimately, uh, what I think is that, yeah, that the standard of, of communion with the successor of St. Peter is fundamental. And that's why we would say, yes, the Catholic Church is the one true church in, in, the, in its performance. And those other churches, whilst churches, as opposed to ecclesial communities as we find in Protestantism, are not the, the, the church. They're rather in, in a partial communion with the church, but not in full communion. Okay. In regards to the papacy, I had a question. Um, so Matthew 16, even so if we say, just grant for the purpose of argument, uh, your case there and say, okay, so Peter's the first Pope. How do you support apostolic succession biblically? I don't support it biblically. I don't think you can find it in scripture. Um, I, think, I think what you do find in scripture is the idea of St. Paul and the apostles appointing successors. Uh, I don't think they call them apostles. Of course, they're not apostles, but I do think you find them um, giving their successors the same authority, um, the authority to be bishops, as they do. Now, I don't think that's the full teaching of apostolic succession, which is why I say you don't find it fully in Scripture. I simply see, I think what you see is, materially, I think you see apostolic succession, so far as you see a handing off. You see, obviously, um, people like Matthias and Barnabas being given uh, a sort of apostolic authority. You see Timothy uh, being given authority by St. Paul, things like that. Um, I don't think that's the full understanding of apostolic succession, though. I think that we look to the early church and their understanding, and they're seeing, as in, for example, the early ecclesiastical histories that we find, I think, in the third century, uh, as early as the third century, we find the idea of, yeah, well, you have uh, Peter, and then you find Linus, and you find Anacletus, and then you find Clement, and, you, and these are successors to Peter uh, in Rome. But you also find successors to the apostles in the other ancient seas, or, or in seas that are planted by, for example, St. Thomas in India. Um, these are examples of where there are ancient seas being set up, uh, the four um, particular prim primatial seas, so in other words, Rome, Alexandria, Constantinople, and, oh no, so five, so Rome, Constantinople, which is later, um, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. And you also find bishops being set up elsewhere as well, throughout the Christian diaspora. So you also find in Armenia, so you have, that's as the Armenian Orthodox, uh, they go as far back as that, and again, some the Indian Christians as well. So what we find is this understanding of apostolic succession, and it's one which is accepted again, uh, and I keep on coming back to this, but it's, it's got Catholicity. In other words, it's accepted across the board. You don't find that some churches set up a kind of pseudo-Presbyterianism, and others set up a pseudo-Congregationalism, and others set up a, pseudo and a kind of Episcopalianism. No, they all set up Episcopalianism. They all set up, over time, this idea that, yes, you've got successors to these apostles, which is why... The Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental Orthodox and the Syrian Church of the East would all say the same thing. Uh, the threefold uh, uh, ministry of pr uh, bishop, priest, and deacon established everywhere. We have this idea of absolute succession being established again everywhere. 
And that is evidence for me of the Catholicity of that doctrine. So I don't feel the need to go to, to Scripture alone. I think the Scripture has the basic germ of these ideas. I think it's, sort of, again, indicative or suggestive of these things, implies them. But I don't think it needs to set them out explicitly. I think we look to take suspicion for that. And going in continuity with that over time, to me, makes the most sense. I mean, I can either do that or I can accept ideas that were found, which are only really developed very, very, very later, I mean, a millennium and a half later. And I, I, I can't do that. I don't feel that has any authenticity. I and I don't feel that that has faithfulness, fidelity with the church Catholic throughout time. And so okay. for me, that's the answer. Um, Callum asks, would early churches in Corinth, for example, have had priests established when celebrating the Lord's Supper or was this to a later development? No, I think that pr the idea of priesthood itself is, a, is, the, is the earliest development. I, I don't see what you can call uh, the apostles performing, doing this as the Lord did so. Uh, I don't, if, if the apostles, going back to Luke 22, 18, says, do this as an anamnesis of me, do this as a memorial sacrifice of me, that's the clear implication of that verse. Also doing this, as in offering his body, this is my body. Again, neuter, neuter noun, neuter um, preposition. So if you're using that, then it's very clear that if you're offering the body of the Lord, then you are, be, you are being, you're engaging in a priestly action. And this is something which has started within the, uh, the cedar meal and then continued on to the cross. So it is off, clearly offering this sacrifice in continuity with this sacrifice. And I think that's what you see clearly with regards to 1 Corinthians 11. Not only that, but I think that the more that we've learned about liturgical history, the more that we've seen there is a priestly character to even the uh, sort of house church celebrations of the Eucharist. So, for example, we used to, there was a fad in the 1960s, which is why so many Catholic churches now do this, of having um, uh, the Eucharist celebrated versus populum, which means the, uh, facing the people. So the priest, rather than having his back to the people, facing the altar, and facing uh, the back of the church uh, in the sanctuary, he's facing the people so that, as it were, the people are here and the priest is behind the altar and it's more like they're having a meal. That was a fad in the 1960s. We now know that actually the, the more ancient practice was no for the celebrants to be in front of the altar, back to the people, offering to God. So that would be uh, celebrating the Eucharist ad deum to the Lord or uh, ad orientum, as we would also call it, to the east, because things were facing, you know, churches were designed facing the east um, after a certain point. But yeah, this idea of ad day and this uh, theocentricity of the liturgy is very suggestive, I would say, of sacerdotal um, belief, sacerdotal practice, because this is the idea of the celibates, the idea of the celibate doing this. Um, and I think that the continuity of that is specifically the idea of the real presence, again, a very Catholic, very universal belief within the church Catholic over time. Uh, again, supports the idea of the priesthood. But no, um, the, the sheer fact of Luke 22, 19, the sheer fact of 1 Corinthians 11, the sheer fact of the marrying of the genders there, and the sheer fact of the import that is given to the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11, such that people can eat and die if they eat unworthily, um, I think is very indicative of sacerdotalism, very, very indicative of the priesthood from the very earliest points, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. We'll get more explicit things about that over time, but I mean, again, or we'll read St. Ignatius of Antioch, who says they, the one thing the heretics do, um, one of the things the heretics do, they deny that our Lord is present in the Eucharist. Um, he's arguing against, of course, the Gnostics who would deny, of course they would deny the idea that our Lord would in some way be flesh uh, in the Eucharist. That would be a horrific idea to the Gnostics, but that, what he, that's what he's arguing against. He's using the Eucharist as a kind of an argument, and an admonition against the Gnostic heretics of his time. I think that tells you something. That's sec early second century. Okay, Callum says, uh, do you know, roughly speaking, when it was doctrine that confession was accepted as a sacrament? Well, again, I would argue very early. I, I referred to the fact that our Lord gives the apostles the ability to forgive and retain sins. I think that's clearly um, the germ of the idea of confession. I don't really see how you get around that. I don't really see an, an, uh, an alternative uh, interpretation of that. And the idea that, oh, it's referring to the preaching of the gospel. Oh, come on. I, I simply don't find that credible. Uh, but um, the idea of, of what does develop over time, as far as we know, are things like the idea of, um, what's it called? Confessing to an uh, auricular uh, confession. So in other words, auricular confession being confession to a priest. That's something which developed sort of a few centuries later. What you had in the early church were I mean, really hardcore penitential practices. I mean, in, in the early church, you would have to confess your sins, if they were, including if they were serious sins, to the congregation and the bishop. Uh, you know, imagine confessing your worst sins in front of your whole congregation. 
Yes. Um, well, I'm glad we don't do that anymore. I'm glad there's been development. Thank God for development. That's all I can say. Um, so there's that. Um, and then there was severe penalty. So it was not just you would have, I mean, today you would have a, the worst penalty you would get is something like, you know, say the stations, I, that's what I've got, the stations of the cross. Say the stations of the cross. If you're aware of that, that uh, Catholic practice, I mean, that takes a good 45 minutes. That's the worst I've ever got. Um, is, is stations of the cross it's a great penance actually but in those days you would have to go outside the church if you had committed a ser- serious sin uh, let's say it was a you know murder abortion adultery something like that you'd have to go outside the church and you would only be uh, after a while after months or years be allowed into the very beginning past the church and then you'd slowly creep up the congregation before you were allowed to take the eucharist again but you were denied the eucharist in, in this entire period hugely intense penitential practices and one of those would have been to sort of public confession, uh, or exomologesis, as they would have called it in the early church. Um, but eventually, after a while, you get this idea of this practice of auricular confession. Um, so that would have been a later development. So confession itself is a continual practice, but auricular confession is a later development. Okay. Let's do one more question, and then I think okay. we can wrap up since it's like 11 here. Um, <laughs> um, huh? Mine flies, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's finish with this one. Alistair asks a question about images. <laughs> explain, <laughs> explain why the Catholic Church's use of images and statues is not going against the Second Commandment, especially when Catholics flock to a specific statue or one that miracles have been attributed to. Why are the Protestants wrong on this, and why should they use images like Catholics do? Jesus and the Apostles certainly never advocated using them, and the Bible explicitly condemns doing so, which are long come Catholic scholars later that claim it is fine. <laughs> what would you say to that? Well, well, what I would say to that is what we find in the second commandment. Actually, what, so there are different ways in which people number the, the Ten Commandments. There aren't actually Ten Commandments. There are ten general sayings. Uh, but I would argue that included within the um, uh, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt, not, no, thou shalt have no other gods before me, is the little codicil about thou shalt not make any graven images. In other words, he's saying, for example, not having other, any other gods, don't make any graven images of other gods, which, of course, they immediately do. Um, with the golden calf. So I would argue that that's what that's saying. It's not saying don't make any images per se. It's saying, it's saying don't make any images that you're going to worship as if it is a god. If it were true that we could not make any graven images, then Solomon would have been sinning. And in fact, uh, the, 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 when they construct the first temple, they would have been sinning by going with the Lord's own instructions to make specific uh, images as part of the temple design. And that would make no sense. It would be scripture contradicting scripture. So clearly that's not what's going on. What we find is that images are used consistently in the early church. There is actually a huge controversy within the iconoclastic uh, controversy in the, um, I think it's the 7th, 8th centuries, um, about the whole idea of using images on exactly the same kind of argument. So in fact, the, Im- the objection to images, in fact, has, a, has a, a far better pedigree than a heck of a lot of other arguments by, by Protestants today. But do you know what happens? It's a controversy that happens, and the church has a, makes a decision against the idea that we should not be using images and the reason for that is very clear I mean, we live we are christianity is unlike judaism uh christianity is not incarnational religion we are a religion and not just an incarnational religion but a sacramental religion so incarnational meaning that god became man god became the man the god man jesus christ and he had an earthly life now when it was simply uh in the early in the uh, old testament you had only the option of making images of God that would have been just sort of random. Uh, I mean, you could have tried to have made something like the Theophanies, but the Theophanies don't offer enough detail about God himself. Um, So really, you couldn't have done much with that. Um, But when God becomes man, he becomes man, he has an earthly body. And the early Christians make images of him. You find these inscriptions uh, and images on the walls of catacombs where our Lord is presented as the Good Shepherd, uh, so that you have the sheep around his uh, around his neck, um, where he's being baptized by uh, uh, John in the uh, River Jordan, things like that. You have find very early images, and this is continually works out. It's only a later controversy that happens. There aren't early controversies about this so quite as much. Now, having said that, there are people like Apophanius who uh, come across images in. He mentions coming across images in an image in a church and tearing it down. The thing is, he doesn't tell us what the image is really like, so we don't know if it was genuinely inappropriate for other reasons. And perhaps it was in some way idolatrous in some other way, but he doesn't go into enough detail for us to really know. 
So we don't really find any consistent and iconoclastic um, tellings against images within the early church, but we do find a very consistent practice of images within the early church and an acceptance of them. So that suggests to us, again, uh, the, the concept of the census fidelium, the concept of that there being a consensus of the faithful accepting this over time, the capitalistity of this practice. But again, it's not idolatrous because we're not worshipping images as gods. I've, I've got an image of our Lord right here, which I think I inherited from my grandmother. Okay? I do not want to put the image. Okay? When I pray, I'm using that as an aid uh, to prayer. It's something that's telling me or showing me our Lord specifically in his passion. It's a very good uh, prompt against temptation because I'm remembering what our Lord did for me uh, on the cross. Um, there are images. I've got some images of our, of our Lady as well around here. Um, I'm not praying as if that is a god. I don't pray to Our Lady as a goddess, for example. I don't see her as a goddess. Um, I don't pray to the saints as gods. And so when I pray to their, so when I use their images in prayer, I'm using it as an aid to the imagination. I'm using that as a, a pious tool. I'm not using that as an image to worship as a god. So all the scriptural um, forbids, all the scripture does uh, forbid in the Old Testament, is the, for, is the worship of an image as a god. And the early church, go to Augustine, Augustine, St. Augustine Hippo, as the concept that we do uh, latria for God, we give worship only to God, but we give dulia to the saints, and we give hyperdulia to Our Lady as the highest of all the saints. And what we do is, uh, with images, we give relative dulia to them. So in other words, we use them not as if they are the people themselves, but we give them a relative form of, of honour and veneration because they represent whom we're really asking for accessory prayer, which is the saints, or if it's our Lord, we're using them as an aid memoir or as an aid to our imagination to pray to the one Lord that we have who is in heaven. So I don't see any basis for rejecting images, really. Uh, certainly not in Christian history. I really don't think it's in, in Scripture either because I don't think it's attacking, I don't think Scripture is attacking the same thing. Uh, and I think that because we're an incarnational religion where God became man and because we're a sacramental religion where we use physical stuff, bread, wine, water, oil, uh, to communicate grace, I think that those are good reasons for saying, no, this is totally consonant with Christian uh, religion. Okay, well, thank you, Peter. Let's uh, wrap up at that point. Thanks so Great. much for coming on. It's been a real thank honor you, talking to you. It's a real pleasure. And if anyone wants to contact me, uh, I'd be very happy to have private conversations. But in the meantime, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's a great opportunity to engage in genuine dialogue. So I really give you full thumbs up for that. It's a great thing to have done. Well done. Well, thank you. Right. Indeed. Have a great evening. You too, mate. God bless. Right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.